17A11 permits a person having an interest in the thing seized to be able to apply to the court to examine it and to ensure that the appropriate safeguards are put in place for the thing to be preserved. So, for example, if at some future date the thing is no longer needed for an investigation or a court proceeding, the value of the thing would not have been diminished due to the safeguards that were put in place for the preservation, thus protecting the interests of an individuals. The aim of this proposed section is to preserve and safeguard the thing seed for the purpose for which it was required. And this is crucial in many sections of many cases. Madam Speaker, the member raised a question as to the interpretation to be given to the words under any law, as used in Clause 14, which is an amendment of the Criminal, Criminal Justice Administration Act. It is to be noted that those words capture the criminal law as well as statute law. My understanding is that when this was being drafted, they were not referenced to things like electronic communication, but it is now appropriate that it not, both, both are captured in the current state. With respect to Clause 14, Consequential Amendment to Criminal Justice Administration Act, we know that the member proposed uh, to include a definition for documents. Sorry, this is where I refer to in the Criminal Justice Administration Act. The word document is now defined by the Oxford English Dictionary as a piece of written, printed, or electronic matter that provides information or evidence or that serves an official record. So the current definition covers your concern. And um, with the, 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 the things are emerging and evolving. <laughs> and, uh, right, yes. And, and for, you know, and for the, the reality of today's world is that time changed pretty rapidly. And as I indicated in another presentation, unfortunately, legislation takes too long to emerge and be perfected. And this is um, the reason why I have to look at how we do it. Because. Yeah. Yes. So, but the, the new, the new de definition covers everything. Right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Get, make sure your course have a new. The newest edition of the Oxford Dictionary. <laughs> Make sure, of course, that the appropriate. <laughs> Not the one that you had when you were going to Oxford. <laughs> no we have the view that the application of the ordinary grammatical meaning of the word document would suffice having regard to the context within which the term is used in the bill. In relation to. Okay, when I get into the clause by clause. Remember, section 13, I indicated where the variation was, member. In relation to the recommendation made by member Golding to amend the proposed 39B2, we propose to replace the word suspect with the word has reasonable grounds to believe. This will remove the subjectivity element in the test in determining whether the offense has been committed. Um, I think I should have alluded to the sex change in clause 13, which is to be approved. So, Madam Speaker, in closing, let me reemphasize strong legislation is critical to sustainable crime reduction. Criminal justice suppression of criminal organization. I close off on clause 14 is a minor amendment. The words have reasonable grounds to believe as opposed to has, right? You know. I think I've covered clause 13, the proposed amendment 17 A or not. Right. I wish to acknowledge the members of the Joint Select Committee and the Technical Team from the Ministry of National Security, the AD's Attorney General's Chambers and the Office of the Parliamentary Council who work closely, working so collaboratively to ensure that this amended bill has a level of rigor and relevance to effectively disrupt and dismantle gangs. It was a little bit late in coming, but we, good work was done and all the members participated. I think we, you know, we demonstrate how maybe we should proceed to ensure quality legislation is brought and dealt with efficiently and quickly by all parties working in close collaboration. 
I look forward to the support of the Honorable House in the approval of the bill and the proposed amendments. Okay. We now go to Okay, and nobody else is speaking. Um, ask for second reading. Minister? Minister, please request second reading. Please request second reading. Should committee. Minister, please request second reading of the bill. Madam Speaker, I now ask for second reading of the bill. The question is that the bill be read a second time. Those in favor? Those opposed? The ayes have it. A bill entitled An Act to Amend the Criminal Justice Suppression of Criminal Organizations Act to specify additional offenses in which criminal organizations are engaged in order to fund their activities to increase the number of offenses under the Act, to expand the list of aggravating factors to be considered when sentencing an individual convicted of certain offenses under the Act, to improve the trial procedure in order to protect the identity of witness and the four connected matters read a second time. The House will now resolve itself into a committee of the whole House to consider the bill clause by clause. Minister, you may now pilot us through the bill. <laughs> if you desire to take all the clauses together, please advise. We did go through clause by clause. I put clause one. Yeah. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. And clause two. I mean, there's section two of the principal act. Clause, clause two has clause, no amendment. You may put clause two through three. To, I don't have to change all the way to 12. Yeah. Uh, we will now put clauses 2 through to 8 as yeah. we have no amendments. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. Clause Aye. 9, Minister. Clause 9 is a minor change, Madam Speaker. It proposed that section 15 to delete the word not a citizen of Jamaica and substitute therefore the words not a citizen of Jamaica or ordinarily resident in Jamaica. That's 15 to E. Clause 9 amends 15 to E to read as that. I put the amendment for clause 9. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. I put as amended. Clause 9, those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. Clause 10? 10 and 11 and 12 would be. You may put 10, 11, 12. We now put clauses 10 through 12, those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. Clause 13 has a change, Madam Speaker. Delete the proposed amendment to section 17A, 6, little a, and b of the Constable Force Act and substitute therefore the following. A, if satisfied that, one, there is no dispute as the person lawfully entitled to possession of a thing, and two, the continued detention of the thing seized is not required for the purposes of an investigation 
or any court proceeding in respect of the commission of an offense against any law. Return the thing seized to the person lawfully entitled to possession of the thing. Or B, if satisfied that one, there is a dispute as to the person lawfully entitled to possession of a thing, and two, the continued detention of a thing seized is not required for the purpose of an investigation or any court proceedings in respect of the commission of offense of an offense against any law, apply to the judge of a parish court for an order under subsection 8A or C. I put the amendments to clause 13, those in favor? Sorry, Madam Chair, just one, one quick uh, point. Hold a moment. If I may, just... Opposition on. leader. The, just record, the, 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 uh, in the opening court, I pointed that the short form we got last week, this was wrongfully printed into it. Oh. So we're correcting it. Oh. That was what happened. The printing uh, officer wrongfully printed it into the short form we had last week, so the short form you're getting is the, is the correct form, so the amendment had to be done. Thank you, but the, the, uh, I don't know if this... If what you've just said addresses what I, I'm going to ask, or right? it may, but I'm just concerned about the, the provision for um, mandatory forfeiture. Forfeiture. Is that mandatory? Madam Chair, just give me a second if you'd be so, just indulge me. I just want to make sure I understand what is being said here. Mm -hmm. the, we know the concern, the appearance of an automatic forfeiture, where the person who is lawfully tied to a position of a thing is not known and the judge is not satisfied with that. The provision actually gives the judge the latitude to make such order disposing of the thing. In quote, make such order but okay. you give the judge the latitude to make the order. All right. All right. All right. All right. Right. Yeah. All right. Thank you. We, we looked at it. Yeah. I put clause 13 um, amendment. Those in favor? All right. Those against? The ayes have it. I put clause 13 as amended. Those in favor? Those against? The ayes have it. Minister. Clause 14, Madam Speaker, you will note a small change. Or where, does, where I had or has reasonable is or have reasonable grounds to believe. Right? So it's a it's a minor but it's a small amendment required. I put the amendment to clause 14. Those in favor? Those against? The ayes have it. I put clause 14 as amended. Those in favor? Those against? The ayes have it. Minister. I think that, that brings us to the end. I want to thank. No, hold on a moment, Minister. We will therefore put clauses 15 through 17 as you yeah. have no further amendments. Yeah. So to the House, I put clauses 15, 16, and 17. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. I now put title and enacting clause. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. The question is that I do report the bill as having passed committee stage with three amendments, those two clauses 9, 13, and 14. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. Thank you. We're coming out of committee now. We are back in the house. I do report the bill as having passed committee stage with three amendments. Only three I saw, nine, 13, and 14. Where is the one I'm missing?
Sorry, I do put the bill as having passed committee stage with four amendments. One amendment to clause 9, two amendments to clause 13, and one amendment to clause 14. Four amendments. Those in favor? Aye. Those opposed? The ayes have it. Ma Madam, um, speak. yeah. Madam Speaker, I now ask the bill be read a third time. The question is that the bill be read a third time. Those in favor? Those against? The ayes have it, Ms. Curtis. A bill entitled An Act to Amend the Criminal Justice Suppression of Criminal Organizations Act to specify additional offenses in which criminal organizations are engaged in order to fund their activities, to increase the number of offenses under the Act, to expand the list of aggravating factors to be considered when sentencing an individual convicted of certain offenses under the Act, to improve the trial procedure in order to protect the identity of witnesses and the four connected matters read a third time and the past. Bill is passed. House Leader. Madam Speaker, I now indicate that the bill, the debate on the, the Trademarks Amendment Act 2021 had previ previously been opened by the Minister and that other members may now make their contribution to the bill, to the debate. Member Hilton. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, the trademark, the trademark bill that is before this this honourable house has been long in gestation and and is of far greater importance than the, the discussion so far may have indicated. I think the Minister has opened and outlined in very significant ways the, the real implications of the, of the amendment. But Madam Speaker, we should, have, we should fully appreciate that this trademark amendment act is part of a system of intellectual property um, laws that give effect to the creativity and the innovation of our entrepreneurs in the various countries. And of course, as has been the case for quite some time, there has been a national registry, a you know, national registration of marks or intellectual property um, originating in Jamaica. This, this bill, though, Madam Speaker, goes much further. And part of the critical importance of this bill is the international effect of these amendments to extend the scope of the protection of intellectual property to a number of countries that are members of the Madrid protocol. And those countries, by now, Madam Speaker, numbers in, in, in over 153 countries. And therefore, by the simple act of registering in one, in one country, paying a single fee uh, in a single currency, and meeting all of the stipulations provided for in the legislation, owners of, of, of intellectual property, and in this instance, trademarks or service marks uh, or marks generally um, can, be, can receive protection for their creative um, works. But, Madam Speaker, 
the effect of this, legis this legislation when passed will also have significant implication for our trade in goods and services. Because, Madam Speaker, it gives a competitive edge to the owners of intellectual property, in this case, trademark. And it also provides um, and addresses the, the, the very important issue of access to markets. We speak in terms, we speak of the act in terms of a conceptual framework, but when applied and in real, in real, in real life, when the act is of, in, invoked, it really assists or trade in goods and services. The, it protects products, the trademark protects products, it protects companies, and it protects um, services, and gives them a competitive advantage in specific markets. And so, as we wrestle with the question of market, trade, of trade market, of access to, 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 to markets, trademarks and intellectual property in general is one of the critical aspects um, that have to be applied to give our entrepreneurs or producers of goods and services that additional edge in global trade. And so, Madam Speaker, when we, when we come to address the issue of how we then respond as a country to this piece of legislation, we have to point out um, to the educational aspects of this legislation is, I think, very critical. We have a number of um, our creative geniuses doesn't lie in a certain group or a certain class of people. The creativity lies broadly in our population, and we have Jamaica is known as people that are very innovative, very creative, and we have to help them to understand the, the real value and the protection that this um, piece of legislation offers. I'm not going to spend the time, Madam Speaker, having to touch on the specific provisions of the Act. What I do want to address are some of the implications that will have to flow from this, the passage of this legislation if we are to really take advantage of it and if Jamaica is going to be benefited um, from the act of um, building out or build out of the intellectual property um, system. Madam Speaker, JIPO, or the Jamaica Intellectual Property Office, is currently a, a small physical operation constrained in many respects by the number of employees and, and, and beyond numbers, the skill level and the quality of those employees. The numbers are relatively small, but we have very high quality. We have a number of persons, some of whom are, I see here in the house today, that are very skilled at what they do at JIPO. But Madam Speaker, if we are to really take advantage of the system of intellectual property, which, which as, we, as we will recall, addresses issues like the Copyright Act, patents, um, industrial designs, geographical indication, trade secrets. All of these are part of a bundle of rights that are granted to our entrepreneurs by virtue of a, um, a number of legislation, that some of which are already in place, and a few that remains to be done. And I see the, the Attorney General here, and I want to use the opportunity, Attorney General, to appeal to, to, to you to ensure that the, 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 the that to, to ensure that the, the regulations um, that attend um, the, some of the acts that have already been passed, like the, the Patent Cooperation Treaty, that those regulations be passed as, as soon as possible. Because even after we've passed the Act, we are not now benefiting um, from the, the fact of having passed the Act. 
without the regulations coming into place. And these are significant pieces, as I said, of legislation that will affect our economy, affects trade, it affects investment, and ultimately employment and the growth in the economy. Madam Speaker, the truth is that intellectual property is as important, and to my mind, perhaps even more important than real property. Real property, we all know, and it has a historical antecedents. The rules and the institutions affecting real property are well established. Intellectual property, less so. Although it is increasingly important that intellectual property is of sig tremendous significance to the, the growth of in our economy and, and employment. We have a creative. Our landmass as an island is limited. And even, even if we include within it the, the archipelagic state of our country that extends the boundaries far and wide, even, even with that, we are still rel relatively small compared to the, mass, the land masses on the continental countries. And so, Madam Speaker, to extend our property rights, we really have to rely on intellectual property and the system of intellectual property that has been created. And uh, the, the fact of international registration and the protection of our trademark or IP inter, um, internationally is of more than passing significance, is of critical importance, fundamental, as I've said, to our trading system and our, our, our trade um, in goods and services and the growth in our economy. Now, Madam Speaker, my principal message is this. Jaipo, Jaipo should at least be expanded to mirror what we have in place for physical property. If you go down to the registration where you register physical property, it's a substantial and imposing business, and I see the Minister of Finance um, listening and paying attention. I'm, I'm pleased because, Minister, this is where some of your resources, your revenues are going to come from. A lot of the revenue is going to come from not only the filing of a, a titles office, but at the intellectual property office. And, and these international registry and registration is going to see a significant increase in revenue, likely to see a significant increase in revenues. Therefore, I believe it is appropriate when these, these, these regulations, these laws and regulations are in place, that you look very carefully at the support services at JIPO. JIPO needs a substantial um, institutional underpinning if it is to discharge its responsibility, not just to Jamaica, but to the international community. And by the way, that should include as well to the region, because there is an opportunity, I would suggest, that if certainly in respect of patents and trademarks, that there is a significant opportunity for there to be a regional registry. And I've long argued and believed that Jamaica should be the location of that regional registry. And uh, I believe that the, there's already, I, I believe in my time we had already sent forward to cabinet. I don't know if cabinet had approved um, our requests that we begin to look at positioning um, Jamaica as that location for the regional um, patent office. But it is a substantial, op it's a significant opportunity, and it's something that I certainly really feel very strongly about. As I've said, intellectual property is, I think, the future of this country because when we run out of land space, as we will at some distant future, hopefully, and we don't have to wait until we run out of land space, the fact is intellectual property must now be developed and be pursued very aggressively. And therefore, I'm urging that JIPO, we look at the supporting systems at JIPO, not just in the, in the number of personnel, but in the quality of the training. We have a small staff there now that is highly qualified. I think we have to build on it. And I strongly urge that the government seize this opportunity because we talk about trade and about expanding our trade and diversifying our trade. And we can, we can no longer 
rely on those limited goods um, that we've pro provide or provided over the years. But even in respect of those goods, it is the trade, it is aspects of intellectual property like trademark or copyright registration that, as I've said earlier, that is going to give it the distinctive edge and the protection that they need to have gain market access and to have beneficial trading and market presence in a very real way. So this legislation, I think, belies or responds to it so far, belies the importance of the legislation. Uh, Minister urged that the, the, the patent cooperation treaty and the regulation attendant to that, that it be pushed because we are not, we are not now benefiting in a significant way from um, that, aspects of I, that aspect of IP. So I want to point out that the, the opposition fully supports this legislation. It has been long in gestation. Um, even before me, I think this went not go, go on for some 20 odd years, but it is, it is, we at least have come to a stage where we are now, we now have the opportunity to, to put the bill, the, the legislation in place and to set up the institutional arrangements that will support the efficient operation of the intellectual property system as a whole in Jamaica. And uh, so, Madam Speaker, with those brief remarks, um, we fully support um, the coming into being of this legislation, but remind the AG and the Ministry that there's more work to be done in terms of the passage of legislation that have already been sanctioned by the South. So the regulations now need to be put in place so that we can really benefit um, from the work that has gone on before. Thank you. Madam Speaker. You may go ahead, Minister. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Just to, to lend my voice and support to this bill um, and to concur with the remarks of, of my colleague as it relates to the importance of intellectual property, something which we have not um, yet had the reality in our country of, of truly maximizing and unlocking its potential. Um, and I do agree that there is need for adjustment in how we structure JIPO itself um, and those operations, but more importantly is for us to really appreciate the true value in intellectual property, particularly for a country like Jamaica where we are fitted with natural assets and unique assets which define our characteristics and which we can utilize um, as, as the opportunity to, to spread our wings across the globe. And this now will make us more attractive to the several countries and companies who want to do business globally and who would have otherwise have selected the countries that are easier to integrate and to enter in terms of their transactions. And, and Jamaica now uh, will suitably be fitted on that list of countries, uh, making us much more attractive to, to companies, particularly the large companies that want to do business in trademarks, um, and also, as you said, uh, making us here locally have that opportunity to exploit not just our jurisdiction, but at a cost effective and in a cost effective way to, to exploit uh, the opportunities that are abound worldwide. I want to just say, Madam Speaker, that I think for us, when you look on our jerk, our rum, our coffee, um, and other things which we haven't yet made worldwide in terms of them being connected to us. The geographical indications are critical. That is, the, the marks that you find on the products that are related to a specific location of origin, which we, we had some discussions last year, I believe, around um, 
us, I think it was our coffee that we were discussing early last year in terms of the protection under geographical indications. But I truly believe that there is need, as we are doing now, uh, to properly have the expansion of the regime around GIs. Uh, there is so much that we can, can receive as a country, not just in terms of revenue generation, but in unlocking the potential of our people. I mean, the intellectual property regimes across the world are connected to the social and cultural development of those countries. And when I had the opportunity, uh, Madam Speaker, to, to interact on behalf of Jamaica, when at that time I was serving as, the, as one of the deputies in our DPP's office um, related to protecting our intellectual property, uh, you, you, really, you really had a first-hand understanding of how other jurisdictions prioritized intellectual property and how much money was coming into their coffers and what they were able to do with it. Um, and we have to, I think, acknowledge and highlight the work of our members at JIPO, the members at the ministry that have worked on this legislation because they are few and they're doing a lot of work, Herculean efforts. And so I see council um, that is here uh, and I want to take the opportunity for us to just thank them for the hard work that they're doing and continue to do, um, as well as others who, whose name, who may not be here with us and whose name I won't start calling names, but who I know contribute to where Jamaica is now and who share my view that there is so much farther that we can go if we really stretch our minds to understand the beauty and the, the, the value in this intangible assets, patents, um, trademarks, copyright. Look on our, look, just look on the inherent qualities of our artist. I mean, Jamaica is world known, but we're also known for being exploited. And that is something which we have to stop. My dissertation was written on geographical indications, Member Cuthbert. And I remember at that time when we were doing the research is when we realized how many products that are directly connected to Jamaica have been completely wiped away and other countries, other companies are benefiting from the name Jamaica, from the connection to Jamaica. Right? And we have to understand how the world sees us. The intensity of respect and value placed on just those letters, J-A-M-A-I-C-A. -A -A. Yeah. And so that is why it is critical for us to, to teach and to raise awareness and in every opportunity to make sure that our children understand and that the entrepreneurs understand and that the Minister of Finance and Public Service understands, who I know will... Um, see a lot of value coming into our coffers once we start to truly exploit the potential. But I just want to lend my support, uh, Madam Speaker, to this um, and thank all of those who have done work for a long time and who I know will be aggressively seeking uh, to, to see to the evolution and the upgrading of the other legislation and regulations that relate to the intellectual property regime for our country. Um, I believe that it is going to be even more important now as the world has transitioned to online um, and it, it, it has opened up a, a whole new sector of online business and other things which, which otherwise uh, were seen as a niche market and it then means that you have to even be more peculiar with how you brand your products, how you protect your products. Um, and how you exploit and unlock the potential uh, through proper understanding and operation of the intellectual property regime. So, uh, Madam Speaker, I lend my full support to it, and I look forward to other advancements in this area. Thanks, Minister. Member Hanna. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Colleagues, um, I want to, in a very real way, say how pleased I am to see this legislation come forward. 
and to congratulate the Ministry of Industry and all its attendant agencies who actually worked. In dialogue with the Minister of State, it was clear that there was significant work being fast-tracked with the private sector organization of Jamaica and the Jamaica Manufacturing and Exporters Association because there were significant barriers for trade and export, and this was one of them. It was important that we had some kind of convergence in the different legislation that we had, which could prevent trade restrictiveness. In other words, we were operating in a world where the barriers had come down in many jurisdictions, and because of that, Jamaica was not operating at its full potential in being able to capitalize on those goods and other people were actually doing it in terms of our services. Madam Speaker, anywhere that I travel in the world, and I'm sure it happened with you and with all of us, the thing that gets people most of the time is the fact that I am Jamaican. So once they hear that you're a Jamaican, everything that is good that gives them comfort comes from Jamaica. Whether it is watching our athletes, whether it is eating some good jerk chicken, whether it is drinking some coffee, whether it is just having that feisty <laughs> and, and ganja. Whether it, whatever it was, and whether it was our confidence in our collective history that would give people courage to do something that they were not expected to do, that was what they associated with Jamaica. And so many times when we even go to the supermarkets in the United States or in other jurisdictions, and we see Jamaican jerk made in another country, it does something to our belly bottom because we know that they are taking away our copyright. So I really want to say, this is a long time in coming. Um, it helps borders to disappear, especially when the Committee on the Economy from CARICOM, other persons are calling for a diversification of our economic base in terms of trade, looking at unfamiliar things like sport and retirement tourism and cultural services and our music. This is a step in the right direction because what it does now is it properly frames out how Jamaicans can utilize their talent and how you can buttress them to move forward and certainly the country and to capitalize on it. And also perhaps with the capacity that my colleague is speaking about, how you can perhaps retroactively get back some of the, 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 the lost revenue that was perhaps being exploited because we didn't have these things in place. And so I want to say, this is a step in the right direction, Minister. Let us fast track it. Um, I would like to see that Jamaicans are aware of it because it's one thing to have legislation and they're not aware of it. And I trust that there will be some kind of interministerial collaboration between entertainment, culture, tourism, sport, industry, justice, finance, that looks at those clutch of projects that we can use to really utilize this trademark. So, with your permission, Madam Speaker, I lend, along with my colleague, the support to this and say that we work very earnestly or in earnest with the private sector organization, the JE, JMEA, and the government to really come out of this COVID fog with this kind of call to action that we can now work together. Thank you. Thanks, Member Hannah. AG. Oh. Opposition leader. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Just to add another dimension to the discussion, which is um, <clears throat> the, the question <clears throat> this legislation, by introducing the procedure of the Madrid Protocol into our jurisdictional space, will assist firms, individuals, who are seeking to protect their trademarks and service marks in a wide array of countries that have acceded to the Madrid Protocol. And that is the main benefit of what this legislation brings. <clears throat> I think it's important to, make a, to put some balance in the discussion, and perhaps the minister can speak to this when he closes as well, because there are some concerns among practitioners in the trademark space 
about what this will do to uh, Jamaica's <coughs> inflows of foreign exchange and revenue generally from what has become a major part of the body of filings, trademark filings that take place in Jamaica nowadays, which are what's called stealth filings. Stealth filings means filings which <coughs> take advantage of the fact that Jamaica does not currently have a searchable trademark register. So you cannot go online and see the full proliferation of what has been filed here. There are rules in international trademark law which would allow and do allow firms that are developing brands but are not ready to launch those brands to file in a jurisdiction like Jamaica which facilitates stealth filings and the effective date of their international protection for those marks commences from the date of the filing in Jamaica. And that has brought with it a large body or volume of trademark work to, the, to this jurisdiction and revenues to JIPO, the Jamaica Intellectual Property Office. And those are revenues in foreign exchange and those are also subject to Jamaican income tax and earn revenue for the Minister of Finance. So <coughs> the implications, as I understand it, and Minister, you can correct me or elucidate on this. Uh, I'm sure you've ha heard this discussion probably more than once. The, <coughs> the implications of acceding to the Madrid Protocol is that Jamaica will have a fully disclosed trademark registry system. And so stealth filings will no longer be possible in Jamaica. And that will have the effect of a reduced volume of filings, um, reduced revenue for trademark practitioners, redu um, and the taxable income that they earn on that work, and the foreign exchange that comes in to Jamaica to pay them and to pay the fees that are payable to JICA for those stealth filings. So I know that the the intellectual property practitioners in Jamaica, the leading ones, have real concerns about what this piece of legislation will do to their revenue and to JIPA's revenue. And I'd be interested to hear, Minister, what your views on that are. The other points I would like to make on this are that I think, like Antigua and certain other jurisdictions, our bill ought to provide for the need for any foreign registrant who wants to register a mark here, having do, doing so through a trademark agent who is an attorney at law um, licensed to, to practice in this jurisdiction. This would ensure that more revenue comes into Jamaica to pay for those services and would also improve the tax base of the country uh, through ensuring that that revenue comes in and, is, and it will be taxable revenue and also the foreign exchange that would come in to pay those fees and it would further develop the economic viability of an intellectual property practice for attorneys and other, and other persons specializing in trademark work but specifically attorneys which is very important because as Brand Jamaica further develops and in the manifestations of Brand Jamaica become monetized in various ways, protecting the intellectual property around that, including things like geographic indicators, trademarks and service marks, registered designs, copyright and so on, all of those things, patents too even. Um, we need to have a vibrant and capable cadre of professionals supporting the, that industry or that aspect of industry and commerce in the country. So it would be useful for the bill to require trademark filings from registrants who are outside of this jurisdiction to be done on their behalf through a registered trademark agent here who would be an attorney at law um, with the necessary um, privileges of being able to practice in Jamaica. This, I think, is not, Jamaica would not be unique in this. Many countries do it, and I think in our case, there's good reason for doing it, especially if we're going to be losing all the stealth filing income, which is substantial. This is not a small 
amount. I'm told that more than 50% of the income of the registry is derived from stealth filings. I don't know if that's true, but so I've been told. And I think also they ought to appoint a place in Jamaica for the service of process if there's a dispute over our Jamaican trademark. And there often is, because trademarks, because they represent the rights over brands, and often they may be close to another mark or close to uh, another brand, in a, whether it be in the word that's used or the logo design, it lends itself to uh, litigation or at least disputation. And I think that we ought to require the filing or, or the, the, the appointment of a local agent for the service of process. Process meaning the documentation that would arise if a dispute is, um, comes into existence, whether it be the, um, the notices and so on that have to be filed, or if it, either if it's going under the Trademark Act, whether it's a dispute that's adjudicated through JIPO, or if it's adjudicated in the courts. Those are two things I would have recommended. And I think I had shared those, those last two ideas with the minister a couple of weeks ago. So, minister, I look forward to when you close, if you could speak to some of these issues and um, let us have the benefit of your thinking on them. But otherwise, I know a lot of work has gone into this. <laughs> I when my colleague to my right was minister of industry and commerce, uh, he was working on this from then. So. These things can take a long time, but it's a good day that it's reached here now. And, uh, you know, and generally speaking, I would lend support to it because I do think as we seek to become a net earner of foreign exchange and do so through leveraging Brand Jamaica, leveraging intellectual property, leveraging the goods and services that are manufactured or, or delivered from Jamaica, having the capacity to protect your goodwill and protect your brands by a single process which you can initiate through Jamaica and then the World Intellectual Property Office handles the registrations all over the world for the Madrid Protocol countries. That's a, obviously a very useful thing rather than having to, to try and do it individually from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, which is what has happened before, to, before now. So thank you, Minister. Well done. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. House Leader and then Attorney General. Um, I will. I just want to make some comments here You're speaking. on this legislation. As a chief advocate of an industry, the culture and creative industries, Madam Speaker, I give my full support to Jamaica becoming a member of the Madrid Protocol and to the proposals in the Trademarks Amendment Act 2021, which are before us today. My colleague on the... My, uh, the leader of opposition business in the House will recall that I've led many delegations to him when he was a minister. And Today, I'm happy that finally we have acceded to the Madrid Protocol. There are still many, many, many more things to be done. Many amendments to come to the copyright legislation and, and so many other things. But we have come a long way, although we still have a way to go. And I hope the Minister of Industry, Investment and Commerce is listening keenly because I tend to be like Matlock <laughs> when I'm dealing with these matters. But the proposed amendments to the Trademarks Act not only enable Jamaica to accede and acknowledge accession to the Madrid Protocol in law, but we are also modernizing the Trademarks Act and trademark rules. These actions together constitute a major game changer for Jamaican entrepreneurs, including members of the creative sectors who will, whose global pursuits will be made easier by these necessary changes. 
The Madrid Protocol for the International Registration of Marks is a treaty administered by the International Bureau of the World Inte Intellectual Property Organization, which is the UN agency responsible for promoting the protection of intellectual property throughout the world. The Madrid Protocol has been ratified by most European countries, the USA, Japan, Australia, China, and many other countries around the world. The Madrid Protocol, Madam Speaker and colleagues, is a one-stop solution to register and manage trademarks worldwide. The protocol will enable Jamaican trademark owners to protect their trademarks in more than 120 territories and counting through a single application filed with the Jamaica Intellectual Property Office. And this is one of the main benefits of the protocol. A trademark owner is required to file one, one dege dege application in one language and pay one set of fees for an international registration effective in the country selected by the trademark owner. Previously, Madam Speaker, a trademark holder, let's say in the music business, would have to file separate applications in each country, paying the requisite legal and other fees, including translation services where necessary. And I heard the leader of the opposition speak to it and, uh, you know, the single filing and the fact that it will affect um, attorneys who would normally act on behalf of these rights owners and trademark owners. But I think the good outweigh the concerns. They can still retain the services on, of an attorney if they so desire. But it allows the ordinary person who has a trademark to go into the Jamaica Intellectual Property Office and file his or her application. I can't overstate how important these amendments will be to Jamaica's creative practitioners and their ability to earn for their creations. It will save our creatives time, it will save our creatives money, while improving protection on their intellectual property. I'll give you an example. When we celebrated Jamaica 50, and just before the change of government, we came up with a logo. And we had many requests to use the logo. And this was the logo we came up with. This was the trademark for Jamaica 50. And we tried to protect it worldwide. But when we checked on the cost of protecting it worldwide, territory by territory, jurisdiction by jurisdiction, all we could do was to register it at Jaipur and pray and hope that it was not exploited and that persons who wanted to use it would make contact with us. And since that, we have registered Jamaica Creative. Since that, we have registered Jamaica 60. And I can go on and on and on. So today, what it does, it puts us even government in a better position to protect, protect our trademarks. Because Jamaica is in demand. Anything that looks Jamaican, sounds Jamaican, I mean, it's all about Jamaica. And people grab the opportunity to identify with Jamaica. So, Clarks, you see the Clark shoes? It's a whole line of Jamaica. But at the same time, we can't do anything about Clarks because they have not used the flag. It's an adaptation of the Jamaican colors, and they just take it to the edge. But it is still about Jamaica. So I want to encourage all our creatives to protect as many elements 
of their works as possible. I would advise people in the music recording business to protect their album record sleeves or the artist's recording name by a trademark because the more elements of a creation that are protected by a trademark, the easier it will be to take action when your work has been pirated. I must say that for some of us who have names that are now considered public figures and brand names, you better check because somebody has taken your name, owns your name. If you were to go online and check, I know somebody has owns the name Edward Sayaga, for example. Wow. Right. So it is important to be aware, be very much aware of these things. I used to promote as uh, <laughs> I used to promote a Thursday night show at Epiphany for those who remember Epiphany. And the title of my show was Live and Direct. For some reason, Live and Direct. And some of my biggest um, supporters who came every Thursday night and queue up outside. Trevor Monroe, with the Fords, so many other persons. And then I took a slight break. And the next thing I know, somebody must have gone to an NEC meeting. <laughs> Wanted to use something that made the other folks connect. <laughs> The person confessed yeah. that he suggested to them to use live and direct. He will, he will support what I say. So the next thing I know, I could resume my shows because live and direct became a political label rather than an entertainment label. So I just want to say to those who are listening, and even in the house, protect your brand. You are a brand. Protect yourself as a mark. It is important. So the amendment, the amended section 12, also has a provision to limit the use of the name Jamaica. The map of Jamaica, the national colors and emblems of Jamaica. Under the new provision, the registrar may impose a condition or limitation on the trademark to the effect that goods or services for which a trademark is registered shall originate in Jamaica. This provision is intended to deal with the problem where many so-called Jamaican products available across the world have no relationship at all with our island home. And then, when you look on the internet, you see the Jamaican flag being used on all kinds of items, some of which I won't even mention in the house. So today, it is a good day. We are continuing that journey. This is a good policy, good legislation, a good legislation that will benefit the people of Jamaica and I give it my full, full support. Thank you, Minister. Thank you so much. Thank you, House Leader, Madam Attorney General. May it please you, Madam Speaker. I rise to lend my support to the bill entitled An Act to Amend the Trademark Act. Most of what I intended to say has been said by others, and in particular, it was my intention to highlight the amendment to Section 12 of the Principal Act. Um, Madam Minister, understandably so, went through that, given the cultural um, and heritage implications of it. But just permit me, because of its critical importance, to, to, to just briefly indicate that where the trademark consists of or contains a representation of the coat of arms of Jamaica, the national flag of Jamaica, or any of Jamaica's 
the national emblem or symbol, the trademark shall not be registered unless the registrar, and it's the registrar of the industrial um, provident societies, that is the registrar who has been designated in this case, uh, is satisfied that consent has been given by or on behalf of the government of Jamaica. Critical move. And where the trademark, which is the subject of an application or registration, contains the name Jamaica or the name of another country or abbreviations or homonyms thereof, map of Jamaica or national colors of Jamaica, as the minister indicated, map of another country or national colors of any other country or national emblems or symbols of Jamaica or national emblems or symbols of another country, then the registrar may impose a condition or a limitation on the trademark in the register to the effect that the goods or services for which the trademark is registered shall originate in Jamaica or in another country, as the case may be. M Madam Speaker, when the law is passed and takes effect, it will do a number of things, but essentially it will make things easier for the registration of trademarks. Um, the administration locally of the International Register of Trademarks is being provided for the setting out of criteria for the international registration, an application procedure for international registration of trademarks, opposition procedure, and the administration of fees. Permit me before I take my seat, Madam Speaker, just to respond to the request by the Honorable Leader of Opposition Business, Member Hilton, who asked the Attorney General to ensure that the subsidiary legislation um, to be passed come out in a timely way. Um, just to remind that the Principal Act um, designates the person to whom Parliament has delegated the power to promulgate the regs or orders or any rule subject to affirmative resolution or otherwise. And so there is sometimes a misunderstanding that it is the Office of Attorney General that has responsibility for these matters. It is really not so. While the Office of Attorney General does play a critical role in the process, and you often hear blame being levied at the foot of the Attorney General's chambers, um, we can only wait until the matters come to the chambers but sometimes they do go around in circle. So from all intent and purposes, um, we have to look at the entire legislative process, be it principal law or subsidiary law, to ensure that the laws are made in a timely way. Because you are correct, the member is correct, um, Madam Speaker, that after the principal act is done, the nuts and bolts that are required for the operationalization of laws are sometimes and oftentimes contained in the regs, the regulations and the orders and they don't always come out. But I can tell you that the minister with courage for this bill, Minister Shaw, has been passionate about the modernization of the process and I do have every reason to believe that working with the JIPO office, whatever remains outstanding will be done in order to ensure that the benefits of the amending law are received fully. So, Madam Speaker, it is a good day. I always get excited when the legislative wheels turn a little faster and the things are done to make life easier for those who must interact with the law on a daily basis. So, on that note, I support the bill to amend the Trademarks Act. Thank Madam you, Speaker. Madam Minister Shaw. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. 
And let me thank all of my colleagues for your, your remarks today. Madam Speaker, I'd like to, first of all, just take a few minutes to answer some of the specific points that have been raised by the that have been raised by the leader of the opposition. And um, I must say, Madam Speaker, that in addition to what he said today, he had shared those concerns with me when on the first occasion when I tabled. He has mentioned three substantive points, and I'll take them one at a time. The first one is that he says requiring foreign-based applicants filing national trademark applications to be represented by a Jamaican trademark attorney. Secondly, requiring foreign-based holders of international trademark registrations under the Madrid Protocol to be represented by a Jamaican trademark attorney when responding to any objections, notifications, refusal, opposition, or other proceedings affecting the trademark in Jamaica. And then he has also mentioned the issue of stealth filing. So I just want to comment briefly on those three things. The first proposed amendment is substantially provided, Madam Speaker, for Rule 9 of the existing Trademarks Rules 2001, by virtue of which foreign-based applicants filing national trademark applications in Jamaica are required to have a local address for service and therefore to be represented by a Jamaican trademark agent who is more often than not an attorney. This, however, is currently a mandatory provision. But under the protocol, Madam Speaker, with the amendments to the Trademark Act, the applicant will also have the option to file and process applications through JIPRO and WIPO. This allows for direct filing without requiring an agent and is a major benefit under the protocol for the applicants. It should also be noted that the amendment to the Trademark Act uses the term agent instead of attorney. It is recognized that the word agent includes, but is not restricted to attorneys. The second proposed amendment is also substantially provided for in new section 61B5, 61C5, and 62A5 of the Trademarks Amendment Bill 2021 by virtue of which foreign-based holders of international trademark registrations under the Madrid Protocol are required to be represented by a Jamaican trademark agent when responding to any objections, notifications, refusals, oppositions, or other proceedings affecting the trademark in Jamaica. However, please note that trademark agents include attorneys, but is not restricted to only attorneys. The third item had to do with stealth filing. And I want to say that we cannot have stealth filing under the Madrid Protocol. However, we are retaining the national trademark direct filing system that's not being removed. So you can still keep that option if you want to have stealth filing in order to preserve your, the confidence of what you're doing, right? So, and this will still allow stealth filing. This, still, this is still provided in our national system since national trademark applications 
are not available to the public until they are published by RIPO. So, Madam Speaker, the government agrees that skilled professionals safeguard the integrity of the intellectual property system and that the absence of skilled local professionals in trademark proceedings can result in unnecessary errors and delays. However, attorneys are not the only skilled professionals recognized in the trademark system internationally. The policy of the government as reflected in the Trademarks Act and of most trademark laws internationally is to allow not only attorneys but also other duly qualified and appointed agents to represent applicants in dealing with trademark proceedings. It should be noted that trademark laws of the European Union recognizes legal practitioners and employee representatives of applicants. Antigua and Barbuda, the Bahamas, Barbados, Belize, Cayman Islands, Dominica, Grenada, St. Lucia, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Trinidad and Tobago, which all recognize trademark agents, including attorneys at law. In the UK and Australia, the use of the term trademark agents does not mean that the person necessarily has to be an attorney at law. What the term signifies, though, is that the person has qualified by training and experience to practice as an agent before a trademark office. Similarly, Canada only recognizes trademark agents, which includes attorneys at law, who have passed a qualifying examination in trademarks and have been certified by their IP office. The trademark agent profession is therefore a recognized profession internationally. There is scope for more Jamaicans to find gainful employment as trademark agents since this has become a lucrative profession. Madam Speaker, in, addition, in accordance with Section 78E of the Trademarks Act, the Minister may make rules in relation to trademark agents. The accompanying trademarks rules to be enacted in support of this bill will include details in relation to the qualification required for being a trademark agent. So in other words, you can't just come and say you're a trademark agent. You're going to have to qualify to be a trademark agent. These rules will be promulgated in short order. The government is committed to ensuring that we create an environment which facilitates the ease of doing business in Jamaica and provide greater employment opportunities where possible. Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, as I close, let me say, and I want to, I want to make it clear, that this, this bill has had a long gestation period, very long, probably as long as about 10 to 15 years. That's, that, that's how long it has been in gestation. And I want to, I want to point out, Madam Speaker, that 124 countries in the world are already in the Madrid Protocol. So if anything, we are, we are late in the game, but better late, Madam Speaker, than never. And I want to say that the system of international registration of trademarks has two primary objectives facilitating the obtaining of protection for trademarks and the more efficient management of trademarks and service marks by the owners of the marks or their agents. The Madrid Protocol, as I wrap up, allows for a centralized filing procedure 
for international registration of marks through the Jamaica Intellectual Property Office in the English language. One set of applicable rules for the international registration of marks and fees are paid in one currency, including one set of administrative fees paid to the World Intellectual Property Organization, WIPO. Madam Speaker, Jamaica cannot miss this boat. With our accession to the protocol, Jamaica will be designated for international registration of marks. This would be beneficial to Jamaica, will be, as it will, simplify the application process for marks, improve access in global recognition and adjudication. A Jamaican applicant will now be able to file one application in English with JIPO and thereafter pay one fee to JIPO to obtain an international registration effective in all selected member countries of the Madrid Protocol as required by the trademark owner. We must keep abreast with the rest of the world. This is a game changer for our companies who wish to register and protect their trademarks in multiple jurisdictions. Madam Speaker, it is very important that we recognize that coming out of the adversity of the pandemic, that this is a very important tool where we must make sure that we register our creativity, register things Jamaican, and make sure that we go, we don't go to Florida as I've seen all the time. We go to Florida and you go to some other place and you see something marked um, Jamaican, and yet it is made in some other country somewhere, okay? This is an opportunity that we have to seize out of the crisis of the pandemic. So with the passing of this act, the ministry will seek cabinet's approval for accession to the protocol. The necessary regulations are going to be speeded up, Madam Speaker, because I end by saying to you, it is our intention to have the protocol ratified and implemented by July of this year. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I beg to move for second reading of the bill. The question is that the bill be read a second time. Those in favor? Those against? The ayes have it. A bill entitled An Act to Amend the Trademarks Act, read a second time. The House will now resolve itself into a committee of the whole House to consider the bill clause by clause. To my knowledge, there are no amendments to the bill. Minister, would you pilot us through? Are we at liberty to take all the clauses from 1 through to 16? We will now take, I put clause 1 through to clause 16 to the House. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. I put the title and enacting clause. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. I sign. The question is that I do report the bill as having passed committee stage without amendments. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. Madam Speaker, I, I beg to move that the bill be read a third time. The question is that the bill be read a third time. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. A bill, a bill entitled an act to amend the trademarks act read a third time and the past. House leader. 
Thank you, Madam Speaker. I now ask for the recommittal of statements by ministers. The question is that statements by ministers be recommitted. Those in favor? Those opposed, the ayes have it. Prime Minister. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, members. Uh, Madam Speaker, it, 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 it is of no real import, but I still mention it anyway, that I am now fully vaccinated. Yeah. You and I, Madam Speaker, we have taken our second shot, and I, I made sure to have the cameras well positioned <laughs> so that um, the skeptics and disbelievers could be satisfied that just to say Madam Speaker that we understand the hesitancy that people may have for vaccination but we also understand the distrust that the country has for leadership, for government, and we go out of our way to show the people of Jamaica that we lead by example and we are not asking them to do what we would not do. Amen. It is important that they understand that I am willing to walk the road that they are on. And indeed, more importantly, I have walked and continue to walk the same road. So I well know and understand how they think, the views and perspectives that they have. And in everything I do, I try my best to maintain the connection, the interaction, the sympathy, the empathy, the understanding, and the patience to bring the differing perspectives that exist to the perspectives that will lead us to overcome and to achieve the prosperity that we need. So, Madam Speaker, even in the holes of contention, even in the very loud cries, even in the accusations, even when the government is being blamed, Madam Speaker, we listen. We listen carefully. We are patient. And when the opportunity presents itself, we bring definitive, clear, and easily understood statements and explanations to the people. So we understand that there will be uproar. We understand that people will be angry. But we do not allow that in any way to phase, to undermine, to weaken the government. We are a strong government. We are a government that is based on principle. a fundamental belief in democracy yeah. and the voice of the people. Yeah. 
We give leadership to the people. And so the people know that though we are not perfect, that like everything man-made, errors will be made. We are fallible. But, Madam Speaker, members, colleagues, the heart of this government is good. And we strive. We strive, Madam Speaker, to bring the people along with us on the journey for prosperity. Based on the, and I'm only taking off my mask for the convenience of speech. Well, when my CMO tells me. <laughs> Madam Speaker, based on the latest report from this morning, Jamaica recorded 37 new cases of COVID-19 yesterday. Our cumulative cases of COVID-19 are now 48,594, with 25,485 of that number recovered. Our recovery rate now stands at 52.4%. The number of active cases, that is the number of persons who still have the virus, is 21,784. Yesterday, as I said, we had 37 positive cases, but this was out of 1,104 samples tested, which is a test positivity rate of 3.4%. The public sector test positivity rate, which is based on the more reliable PCR tests, was, however, 6.6%. The target, Madam Speaker, which the WHO recommends, uh, is 5%. Uh, so we are not quite there yet, but we are heading in the right direction, and one day's test result does not make the average. But we are heading the trend we are heading. It, it will fluctuate depending on several factors. Unfortunately, we have lost 949 persons to the pandemic. I extend my deepest sympathies to all Jamaicans who have lost loved ones to this terrible virus. On the graph displayed, the blue bars represent the daily number of new confirmed cases of COVID-19. The red line represents the seven-day moving average of new cases. And the orange line represents the seven-day moving average of new hospitalizations. Madam Speaker, both lines have been trending downwards with the number of new cases declining faster than new hospitalizations, as there is usually a lag between onset of symptoms and hospitalization. So, Madam Speaker, as you can see, both lines trending down, except we are seeing a bump upwards in new hospitalizations, which is of concern, but we are watching it very closely. This demonstrates that the measures implemented since the end of February have been successful in controlling the spikes. And here, Madam Speaker, I want to thank every single Jamaican who made the sacrifice to abide by the protocols, to stay at home when required to do so, 
maintain the quarantine when required to do so, wear their masks, maintain the social distancing, those persons, Madam Speaker, they are the reason why we see the numbers declining. And I want to personally thank, as I said, all Jamaicans who have been responsible and faithful in observing the protocols. Yeah. Madam Speaker, the next graph that is now displayed shows our hospitalizations relative to our bed capacity. The gray line shows the number of persons in the hospital, and the black line shows our hospital bed capacity. Madam Speaker, as the black line shows, yes, it, it shows white on the screen, but it's printed gray. Madam Speaker, as the black line shows, we have consistently increased our hospital bed capacity allocated to COVID-19 patients. We have now increased our allocations in terms of beds to over 700. You'll recall the last time I addressed the parliament, we would have been somewhere in the region of about 650. So we are consistently increasing our capacity. While our hospitalizations have been trending down and are now significantly below our bed capacity, we are still in the high risk category and need to see a further decline. In order to control the most recent spike, we implemented a number of tighter measures since February. As the graphs show, those measures have been successful. Madam Speaker, the government is very sensitive to the fact that these tighter measures have taken a toll on the livelihoods of many. They have also had a negative psychological impact on the population. The negative psychological impact has been exacerbated by the perception that the burdens of restrictions and the measures is not felt equally by all in the society. The recent events at a certain cafe in the West has reinforced this perception and unleashed a sense of frustration and Madam Speaker, as I indicated last week, I've asked for an investigation into the event and the circumstances and reinforced to the various arms of the state that have a duty to ensure the equal application of the law. Madam Speaker, managing the pandemic is as much about the public health considerations as it is about justice considerations. Madam Speaker, historically, we have been an unequal society with wide disparities in income and savings, wide disparity in property and shelter ownership, wide disparity in educational attainment, but of even greater concern is the wide disparity in information. While we live in the information age and many Jamaicans have access to the internet, we do not all use information in positive ways to overcome poverty. Yeah. I believe, Madam Speaker, that is probably our greatest challenge. Information is all around us, but we don't all use the information in the same way to overcome poverty. Measures to manage the pandemic and slow the spread of the disease throws up serious equity issues in our society. 
any action to slow movement and gatherings will have a negative impact generally on the economy, but will have a disproportionate impact on the poor, who by definition have lower or no income and no savings. Job losses or reduced work opportunities will immediately have a negative impact on poor households. Measures requiring persons to shelter in place, curfews, stay at home, and work from home will disproportionately affect persons who don't have proper shelter and access to the internet to enable virtual connections and virtual work and learning. Limited access and information management literacy, because we have different types of literacies. There are many persons who are literate in the traditional sense, being able to read and write, but their ability to seek information, verify information, place information in context, and use that information to change their behavior and inform their expressions. That is not a widely spread skill and functionality in our society. Don't call their name. Unfortunately. Don't call their name. Unfortunately. So, for example, while there is copious amounts of information about vaccines, and if you really wanted to find out about vaccines, you could get the information. The, the, the government puts out the information, and if you don't believe the government, there are many other sources. If you don't believe what the Ministry of Health here is saying, then you can follow the CDC, or you can follow the WHO, or the information is there. But you may choose to follow some, you know, let me not, let me, let me, let me not go there. But it depends on how you seek information, how you interpret the information that will impact your behavior. But, Madam Speaker, it is not only the impact on your behavior. How you process information, Madam Speaker, will determine your life chances. So one of the things I'm very concerned about is that persons who seek legitimate and contextualized information will probably make the decision to take the vaccines. And others who don't will probably make the decision not to. How is this going to affect the equitable recovery of the society? That, that is a question that we have to wrestle with. Let's take it, let's, let's move from the individual level, but let's take it from a country level. We are already seeing that countries that have high levels of vaccination, their society is returning to normal. Their economy is booming and returning to normal. The problem, Madam Speaker, is that the information dimension of poverty, which we don't usually pay attention to, we, we assist people with the income dimension of poverty. We, we try to give them conditional cash transfers or just straight cash transfers. We try to help them with jobs. We, we try to ensure that we have social safety nets to buffer the income, the access to amenities dimension of poverty. We try to give people health care and proper roads and proper housing, but we have to spend a little bit more time on the education system to ensure that the poor get information, not just information, but that they are able to process it into knowledge and have that knowledge transform their behavior and their lives to improve their life chances so that they too can survive in the new world. The greatest challenge that we face as a government is to try and communicate 
positions that are in the interest of the poor. But you have people who know better who mislead and misdirect. <laughs> and at the end of the day, Madam Speaker, if you ask one of those persons who, who preach the alternative message, you're in the hospital, or you need oxygen, or you need support, and you ask, help me. When you get sick, who you call? <laughs> so I'm saying to the average Jamaican, yes, you have your free choice. And the government protects that, and we guarantee that. But we are asking every single Jamaican to use your best sense. Use your best sense. You may not trust the government. Find another source that is reputable. Get your proper information and make your right decisions. Because much of what is said on social media, carried in newspapers and news, if you really analyze it, it is a lot of noise, uninformed perspectives that lead people astray, that makes it difficult to guide decisions that are needed immediately. So we take a lot of time just trying to get to the right decision because we have to go through this process of very detailed explanation, bite sizes, so that people can digest that process and at the same time keep people's eyes on what is realistic, what is proper, and what is in their best interest. <laughs> you know what? Let me not respond to you. <laughs> no, 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 no. Let, let's leave it. Yes. All right. All right. All right. <laughs> so, Madam Speaker, <laughs> another dimension of our inequality, another dimension of our inequality, and indeed our poverty is informality. Yes. People don't usually look at informality as a dimension of poverty or inequality. But if you look at who is in the informal sector, a large part of the informal sector would be the, the poor. And some people feel that it is necessary to be informal to be protected from the state a mindset that we have to change. Madam Speaker, informality can be voluntary or the involuntary exclusion of the citizen from the recognition and record of the government. The pandemic requires social care support from the state. When you are out of work, when you can't buy food, the government has to step in and provide the support. But the state cannot effectively do so as large numbers of our citizens do not have unique identification and are not included in the financial system. It's a big problem. Madam Speaker, when the Minister of Finance developed the care program, and we sat down and we said, how are we going to do this? Because we have so many unbanked persons in Jamaica. Unbanked, they don't have a bank account. And then we had to figure out what level of identification are we going to use? You know, other programs, you know, Madam Speaker, we just give away the money. There was no real attempt at trying to ensure that the designated beneficiary is the actual beneficiary that received the funds. So we face a big struggle in our society, which is really part of the definition of our poverty, that uh, many persons want to hide away from the state, stay informal. But in issues like these, when we have 
a pandemic, a disaster, and the state needs to act in defense and support and protection of its citizens. It doesn't know them. And we can't just, I see a member from Central um, Clarendon smiling through his mask. <laughs> and if, if he were to stand up, he would be telling us about the mis about reparation, but the miscount of the population. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the undercounting of the population. So, Madam Speaker, the point I'm making is that a part of our we are trying to correct something that is deeply ingrained in the citizen that they, they, they don't trust the state, hide away from the state. But the state can't help you when you have an emergency or a disaster. The, the, the problem is that this perspective on the state, Madam Speaker, it's not just that it has emerged as an underculture. It is preached every single day by the intellectuals of this country. Every single opportunity that they get, they decry the government and push the people away from their government. And Madam Speaker, what this government has demonstrated is that we have put in place the systems and mechanisms to be able to distribute public resources in keeping with the rules and regulations we have distributed to half a million Jamaicans $20 billion and for the first time in our history there has not even been one complaint of any diversion, misallocation of public resources. Not one. I believe it is a watershed period in our history that Jamaicans must come into the formal system. Make yourself known to your government. Your government is not your enemy. Your government is there to protect you and look out for you. The only way, Madam Speaker, we are going to build a strong state is when every single Jamaican knows that he's recognized by his government and his government stands for him and will protect him. Madam Speaker, and if it is one dollar in the budget, we're going to divide it up fairly and equally and ensure that it is distributed and accounted for fairly and equitably. Madam Speaker, I've gone through all of this because the government must be careful not to exacerbate these pre-existing structural inequalities by applying measures that will give advantage to one group over another or to be enforced more leniently for one group over another. And that is what the citizens are looking on now. Is the DRMA Act giving an advantage to one group over another? And are the arms of the state empowered to enforce enforcing more leniently on one group over another? This is a genuine question that must be asked and this government more than any can't shy away from it we have to grapple with it madam speaker two nights we have had meetings one going up to midnight and the other to 11 o'clock last night just trying to get through this issue this balancing act and i i can't here tell you that we have the perfect solution that's not what i'm here telling you what I'm here saying, Madam Speaker, is that we are trying our best. You know, Madam Speaker, I, I, I read something today, today to our COVID cabinet meeting on Saturday. And I, I, maybe I shouldn't read it here, but no, it's all right. Oh, oh. It's all right. But it, it was a comment on, on Twitter. Yeah. 
You know, Madam Speaker, and I'll, I'll just read it because it's, it's important. I'm not going to say who the person is, right? But the person says, Andrew, honestly, to say I am upset is an understatement. People are suffering because of these nightly curfews, can barely pay bills and buy food. Small business sector suffering due to weekend curfew hours. But a certain event can keep. Foreigners can come here and breathe while we are here suffocated. It's a, it's a powerful statement. Powerful statement. The government is not setting out to create an unequal society. We are not setting out to prevent people from breathing. It's not our intention deliberately luck that we have to put on curfew. If I didn't have to do it, it wouldn't be done. And the, I, the members of the cabinet can tell you. I am the strongest advocate for opening up. But, Madam Speaker, this is what is capturing the mood of the people right now. But bear in mind that I could read another text five weeks ago when it was a totally different complaint that the government is weak, that I am not responding as prime minister, that the pandemic is getting out of control, that they can't hear from me, that people are dying, people can't breathe because we don't have any oxygen. Speaker, there are two sets of perspectives in Jamaica. Yes. One set is that I just want to live. I'm tired of this lockdown. And then the other, the other set now just say, I don't want to die. I don't want to die. How do we reconcile? Because there's a level of selfishness yeah. and short-sightedness in the conversation about how we manage the pandemic. It is selfish to say, but, but hold on, it is selfish to say, I just want to go party. I just want to go about my business and don't wear a mask. But you may go home and your grandmother dies. No, the, the problem is, is that I can't separate society and say, you low risk, because if I had the statistics here, persons 40 and over, the risk, start, the risk of a fatal event from the infection, from COVID, starts to double. I can't, sorry, go ahead. I, I'm, I'm coming. So, 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 Madam Speaker. If we could separate the population and say, those who are low risk, you go about your business. <laughs> and those who are high risk, you stay home. They call it el elder shielding. If we could do that effectively, but we can't. There's a, there's a shared risk and a shared burden and responsibility. And I just want that to be understood in the society. How we have operated as a government is that as soon as we see an opening for return to normalcy, we allow people to get as close to normalcy as we can. Yes. Right? It's not our intention to keep people locked down. But we also have a duty to protect the vulnerable in the society. And we have put in place measures to protect the vulnerable, and we have put in place measures to allow commerce to go, to, for people to keep getting their jobs, for investments to continue. And we're going to continue, Madam Speaker, to try to do both things, to allow the people who want to live to live, 
and the people who don't want to die to live as well. We, we're trying to do both things. It's a very difficult decision. So, Madam Speaker, as I said, I understand why people are upset seeing parties being held in one area of Jamaica while parties in another area are restricted. I understand that. You know, there are people keeping parties in Canefield and the police find them and arrest them. That little money mash up in my own constituency. A lot of resources, my personal resources and state resources in creating the hip strip in, in West Central, St. Andrew along Olympic Way. And I know they are feeling it because that is a party central area for Kingston. But parties can barely keep. So I know they are feeling it and I know they would be very upset to see advertised on social media of people partying elsewhere in Jamaica. I, I am upset too, I, I must tell you. So let me say clearly that no such events have been sanctioned under the DRMA. The DRMA does not give any authority for such events to be kept or any leniency as to how enforcement should be done. As I have said earlier, I have started the process of determining if there was any administrative complacency, negligence, or complicity in the circumstances surrounding the holding of the event. Already, action has been taken in keeping with the DRMA and the regulations under the TPDCO protocols. One thing you can say about this government, the law will be enforced. I am very upset, like everybody else, that this happened. It should not have happened. It has happened, and we have acted. And I want to be clear. We have arrested people keeping dances in cane fields, and we have arrested people keeping party on top of high-rise buildings. We have applied the law equally. Some people would want to use it as a defense for their case. See, it's only poor people attacking, or see, it's only this set of people attacking. No, that's not true, and that must be rejected. We must never allow the narrative that the government is just targeting one set of people. Never allow that, because it is not true. We have been applying the law right across the board. It's very important that that be said. And if, if the government is negligent, complacent, or complicit, it is my duty to be truthful about it, to find out what has happened, and hold people to account. Madam Speaker, we recognize the vital importance of tourism to the country in terms of employment, foreign exchange, and local linkages. Madam Speaker, regardless of that, there is only one Jamaica. Only one Jamaica. So we're not going to tolerate any special treatment. Out of many, Jamaica, a diverse country, but for us to truly be one people, there must be one law and one application of it. So Madam Speaker, our approach to the pandemic has been, as I've said, evidence-based. We look at the numbers, we look at the science. We have been measured. We don't go overboard. We try to create a balance. We have been proportionate. We don't use more than we have to use. And we have been situationally appropriate. We look at the specific situation and we craft the measures to suit it. But more than that, Madam Speaker, we have been fair and equitable in the management of the pandemic. 
while we cannot become complacent, the declining numbers, Madam Speaker, do support some recrafting of the measures. I don't know if you can call it relaxation. And I do it want to. It's, we are recrafting the measures. However, I must hasten to say that while there has been improvement in our situation over the last two months, and again, thanks to the sacrifice of the faithful and responsible Jamaicans, significant risks remain. Madam Speaker, Trinidad that kept its borders closed had a spike. They, at one point, they, they almost had as many cases per day as we had during our spike with half our population. Their borders closed. Suriname, small population, not much incoming um, travel, higher level of vaccination than us. They are about to close again. We know the situation with India and other countries. Let us not fool ourselves that because the numbers are going down now, we just forget about it. We forget that we just came out of a spike where, Madam Speaker, the true suffocation was that people didn't have oxygen. The true suffocation was that people didn't have beds. But we forget about all of that. It's as if it never happened and now the measures are stifling. It is the heights of selfishness. and unreasonableness. So, Madam Speaker, only approximately 5% of our population has received the first dose of the vaccine. Less than 1% now fully vaccinated. It might be a little bit more. They are tabulating the figures. So we are nowhere near other countries that are taking risks and opening up and their public health authorities saying, dispense with masks, dispense with this, dispense. We are nowhere near. And those who hold this idea that Throw the virus don't affect me or it's, it's a fake virus or just cast your mind back to where we were in February, where you were silent, we never heard you. Madam Speaker. The other issue that we must pay attention to, every single Jamaican must pay attention, is that whilst we are vaccinating and people coming in maybe have a higher level of vaccination than persons who are here, is that there are emerging new variants. Almost on a monthly basis, you are hearing of a new variant. And not all vaccines cover the spectrum of variants. So there is still that risk that there could be another, another wave that even vaccinated persons would have an elevated risk. So I, I want to return some semblance of levity to the conversation. Madam Speaker, we must therefore take a gradual and measured approach to relaxation of these measures, or rather, recrafting of these measures. It is critical that all Jamaicans remain cautious and diligent in observing the protocols. Wearing masks, physical distancing, and sanitizing. We are now, we have now experienced two spikes in Jamaica. We know the behaviors and the complacencies that result in spikes. Let us not repeat the mistakes of the past. Let us view the recrafting of the measures not as a license for free for all, but as an opportunity to safely pursue our livelihoods and other activities that enhance our spiritual 
and mental health needs, let us exercise personal responsibility to prevent a third wave that will force us to tighten the measures once again. Madam Speaker, the new measures that will apply for a four-week period to June 30th, 2021 are as follows. Curfews. The curfew hours for weekdays have been recrafted. And will begin on Thursday, 3rd of June, about the weekdays, cur weekday curfews now, will be from 9 p.m. to 5 a.m. the following morning, ending at 5 a.m. on July 1, 2021. So effectively, the curfew hours move from 7 to 9 weekdays. 8 to 9, yeah. 8 to 9. I know some people were expecting 10. As, as I said, it's not to be deemed relaxation. It is, it is. <laughs> Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker. They are hoping to flash on the off stone. I am certain that this ball is going to spin and knock out your middle stump. <laughs> or, or better, knock down the block that they put up. <laughs> For weekends, Madam Speaker, the curfew will begin at 8 p.m. on Saturdays and on 2 p.m. on Sundays and end at 5 a.m. the following morning. So we have done, Madam Speaker, a recrafting of the hours to allow for greater commerce. And I think that is significant. I, I, I know that small business people and large business people may not be satisfied that they were lobbying for 10, but we have done what we believe is necessary to allow commerce and at the same time prevent a rapid increase in the numbers. So, Madam Speaker, on Saturdays, two more hours have been given which I think is, will be useful. Sundays remain the same. And we, we, we had to do that, Madam Speaker, as a kind of compensatory measure, just to, to make sure that we slow the, the numbers that could occur. Madam Speaker, the, the member from St. Anne said, you know, why not just make it 10? Up, up. In keeping with our approach, the principle of moving gradually. So we're going to do nine and eight. We're going to observe. We're going to see how people treat with the, 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 the recrafted measures, how they wear the masks, we, which you know, I have to give the Ministry of Local Government and ADPEM credit because they do go around and do surveys. And they report to us they report to us in cabinet, this is what is happening in the bars, this is what, what is happening at the beaches, this is what is happening at the rivers, this is what is happening in the salons and the barber shops, this is what is happening in the markets, and they give us a good sense of how people are following the protocols. Controlled entry protocols. Madam Speaker, globally, travel has been increasing with vaccination levels. During the past week, the United States Transportation Security Administration recorded the highest level of travel since the pandemic. I understand that many flights are operating at capacity. Between May 1 and May 28, 2021, 
approximately 125,000 applications for entry were processed on the Jam COVID Visit Jamaica platform. Of this total, approximately 115,000 were visitors. The comparative number for April 2021 was approximately 90,000. Recall that in May 2020, our borders were closed. In May 2029, in May 2019, somebody's phone. We had approximately 211,000 stopover visitors. So technically now, Madam Speaker, we are roughly at 55% of pre-pandemic levels. People are traveling and people are choosing Jamaica as a country to travel. Our control entry protocols remain a critical element of our overall COVID-19 management. The requirement for all incoming travelers to present a negative COVID-19 test conducted within three days of travel remains in place. However, we have reduced the quarantine requirement for fully vaccinated persons to eight days. Eight days. <laughs> to be clear, to be clear, we do not consider persons fully vaccinated until two weeks after they receive the full dosage of the vaccine, meaning both doses in the case of a two-dose vaccine or one dose in the case of the Johnson uh, the J, the, the, um, Johnson & Johnson vaccine manufactured by Johnson & Johnson. So, for example, well, I don't have to make that example. So for persons who are not fully vaccinated, the quarantine period remains at 14 days. I think that's a major concession Business persons, regular travelers have been complaining about the loss of productive time. People have to go and look about their business. Many of them are key executives in their organizations and their prolonged absence could have a material negative impact on their business. Um, many of our ministers are now required to travel and have been traveling. Uh, one minister said to me, well, it's a good break. But at the same time, he's saying, you know, I need to get back into my office, but I dare not go outside. He's here, but he's in quarantine. <laughs> so, Madam Speaker, I believe that that would be, again, not what people would want. The argument has been going around that fully vaccinated persons should not be required to quarantine. Our public health is of the view that they are required because there is still a risk of them carrying and transmitting into a population whose immunity is still naive to the virus. So we have reached a, a compromise which we will monitor very closely to ensure that there is no abuse of it. Madam Speaker, we note that a number of countries have issued different protocols for fully vaccinated persons. This was extensively discussed by the Cabinet, and we will also need to consider further changes to put ourselves at a competitive advantage in our market. This is in our tourism market in particular. This is particularly so in the context of large numbers of persons being vaccinated in our major source markets. The challenge, Madam Speaker, is that while vaccinated persons are themselves protected, as I said before, they still may be carriers of the virus and are able to transmit to non-vaccinated persons. We await more definitive scientific data on this as we consider further changes to the protocols. Given concerns about more transmissibility of variant strains of the virus, the travel, the travel restrictions for 
South American countries, Brazil, Chile, Peru, Colombia, Argentina, and Paraguay, as well as for India and Trinidad and Tobago, is also being extended until June 30th, 2021. Of course, we continue to reassess these as circumstances warrant. Stay at home for persons of a specified age. The age limit for the stay at home measure remains at 60 until June 30th, 2021. However, persons who are fully vaccinated will be exempted from this. We therefore encourage all persons within the vulnerable age group to get vaccinated. And when you get vaccinated, you keep that card close at hand. Let me just repeat that, Madam Speaker, so that we are clear. The stay at home measure, which is the elder shielding measure, which is to shield the most vulnerable part of the population and we have put the vulnerable marker at age 60 that measure remains in place however if you are fully vaccinated meaning that you have received the required dosage if it is a two dose vaccine and you got the two doses two weeks after we consider you to be fully vaccinated or if it is a one dose vaccine and you have got the dosage two weeks after we consider you fully vaccinated you are no longer under the elder shielding measure the stay at home measure you can go about your business wearing your mask of course and following all the other protocols <laughs> Madam Speaker, the existing work from home directive in the public sector is being extended until June 30th, 2021. Therefore, only persons who work in critical service delivery and perform job functions that require them to be at the physical location should be at the office. For the private sector, employers should allow all persons who can work from home to do so. Now, Madam Speaker, recall that in the last vaccination exercise, we did make a provision for 5,000 critical public, serv public service workers to get vaccinated. As soon as we have data regarding the number of them that are fully vaccinated, again, we will make adjustments to the order so that persons can return fully to work once they are fully vaccinated. Gathering limits. The public gathering limit will remain at 10 persons until the 30th of June 2021. Public entities may now hold events such as handing overs, launches, groundbreaking, opening ceremonies and so forth. Uh, and that limit is placed now at 30 persons with being physically present, of course, with all the other protocols established. And the reason for this, obviously, is that the government's work is being Im impacted and, and hampered and uh, we need to move the government's work along but government like other institutions can manage events and so this you're seeing a kind of shift to institutional management rather than a dependence on the general measures to manage gatherings so we will be considering as we move along into this new phase of the management of the pandemic, putting more responsibility on institutions to manage rather than having to depend on, say, for example, curfews and setting gathering limits. If, if institutions and persons take greater responsibility, then the kinds of restrictive measures that the government would have to implement would be less. Markets. For markets and vending in public arcades and public transportation centers, operating hours will be from 6 a.m. to 7 p.m. on Mondays through Saturdays. Markets will remain closed on Sundays. Public transportation, public transport, public transportation operators 
will still be allowed to be on the road one hour before and one hour after the curfew, but there can be no passengers in the vehicles during these periods. Madam Speaker, all persons in PPV vehicles, public passenger transport vehicles, are reminded to wear masks at all times and sanitize before entry and exit of vehicles, ensure the windows remain open and the AC is turned off during trips. As a reminder, motor vehicles that provide public transportation are to have one less passenger than is allowed by the license. Funeral services. Funeral services are not permitted during the period ending June 30th, 2021. Madam Speaker, let me explain as there appears to be some confusion around this. What this means is that services with the mortal remains being present are not permitted. Let me, let me put that in terms everyone can understand. The DRMA considers a worship service to be a funeral if the body of the deceased is in the church. Otherwise, a gathering in a church is considered as a normal worship service. You may term it a memorial service, a celebration of life, or whatever you'd want to term it. So it is possible to have a service in honor of the deceased. But in keeping with the measures that govern normal worship services. But you are not permitted to bring the body of the deceased into the church. And I'm not going to go into the public health issues. I've explained that already. You know, just by doing that, you remove one element of the spread, which would be people moving around for viewing and these kinds of things. And we don't need to, to go into the other emotional, you know, the, 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 the emotional impact of seeing your loved one in the coffin and so forth and the, what that evokes and the, the behavior that evokes. So there are good, strong public health reasons why we have taken that decision. Burials. Madam Speaker, the existing limits on burials remain in place. The maximum number of mourners permitted is 10, with an additional five persons allowed, comprising the officiating clergy, grave diggers, and undertakers. Therefore, the maximum number of persons at any burial is 15. As a reminder, Burials will be allowed on Mondays to Fridays only during the hours of 9 a.m. and 4 p.m. and the time for conducting the burial is limited to 30 minutes. Madam Speaker, we have had to maintain this protocol as it is because when we have analyzed the behavior of the public in this activity, we see a very low level of adherence and compliance with the protocols. It is still a very risky activity. Worship services. Madam Speaker, the maximum number of persons who may be physically present to facilitate worship or electronic broadcast, including officiating clergy and technical support personnel, will be increased from 30 to 50 persons effective June 3rd, 2020. As a reminder, normal worship or memorial services are permitted, but no crusades, conferences, or conventions are to be held. I just want to be clear on this, Madam Speaker. The way it is written in the DRMA is that the churches are allowed to have one person 
for every 36 square feet of church space, up to a maximum of 50 persons. So even if your church is massive, the maximum that you can have for now is 50. We will be reviewing. The ODPM will be going around visiting, making the reports, and we will review. And once we see that there is a high level of compliance when taken with all the other moving parts, we will make further decisions about the churches. I must say that the churches have been very compliant, particularly, Madam Speaker, particularly the established churches, they, they understand. I meet with them regularly. I know they are going under a lot of pressure, <laughs> Madam Speaker. You know, the, the, the churches have a business element as well, and they have a care element. They have to care for their, <laughs> their congregation, and the pandemic is having a tremendous impact on them. Many of them have schools, they have clinics, they have all kinds of outreach, and the resources that would come in from a full church is just not there. I encourage people, Madam Speaker, especially those who still participate on Zoom, still give your tithes. It is part of our Christian tradition. It is part of what our religion requires us to do. And the church is doing, uh, I would say, uh, an amazing job in supporting the vulnerable and those who are in need of help and support, not just from physical support, but who need psychological and emotional support. Madam Speaker, weddings, the cap on the number of persons permitted at a marriage ceremony will be increased from 15 to 50. So, you know, this is, June is, is, is um, what are they call bride month? That's, <laughs> so, 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 Madam Speaker, uh, we, are, we are encouraging this activity for, well, for all kinds of reasons. And so far, what we have seen is that there is a fairly high level of compliance with the measures. Uh, some people have even thanked me for keeping the measures tight. <laughs> but, but, Madam Speaker, this is not to say that the square footage rule does not apply. It applies for weddings as well. So don't fit 50 persons into a small area. You must maintain that 36 square feet uh, per person rule. Beaches and rivers. All beaches and rivers will open effective June 3rd, 2021 but they will be subject to the same protocols as are applicable to those that are under organized management and control. Madam Speaker, this is one that we agonized over because the last time we opened the beaches and rivers, people just took it as free for all. I'm hoping that we would have seen what was the consequence of that and that we would be more responsible. Madam Speaker, we know exams are going to be over by mid-July. Children are home, frustrated. They need some recreation and open-air activity. We understand that, but we are appealing to parents and adults to be responsible. And I, you know, anyway, I, I, this is one that we'll be monitoring very closely. So, Madam Speaker, no more than 10 persons at a time shall gather in any one area of the beach. So, we are encouraging you go with your known group and stay in your known group. Don't go and mix up all over because that would be the recipe for disaster. Everywhere. Everywhere that's considered a beach. And, and just to be clear, the same law applies if you have a boat or if you don't have a boat. So, Madam Speaker, 
activities at the beach shall be limited to swimming, exercising, sunbathing. No beach parties or group games such as football and vol volleyball will be permitted. Beach activity. Beaches and rivers will be open from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. on Monday to Saturday and 6 a.m. to 1 p.m. on Sunday. I think, Madam Speaker, that's very reasonable. Zoos, parks, gyms, attractions, and bars are subject to the existing re restrictions and must close at the designated times until June 30th, 2021. So it's the same rules that are uh, applied before and the old order applies now. Amusement or gaming arcades not licensed under the Betting, Gaming and Lotteries Act must remain closed until June 30th, 2021. Indoor cinemas and establishments that stage theatrical or artistic performances will remain closed until June 30th, 2021. The ban on events such as concerts, parties, tailgate parties, round robins will continue until June 30th, 2021. Madam Speaker, the government is cognizant of the devastating impact that the pandemic has had on the entertainment industry and the large number of persons who depend on the industry for their livelihoods. We are engaged in discussions with the industry with a view to agreeing the appropriate protocols that could facilitate a limited reopening of the industry in the summer. Madam Speaker, you will recall that in our previous attempt to allow entertainment to open up in the summer of 2020 was one of the factors that resulted in our first spike. The discussions have been constructive and encouraging, and the industry has expressed a commitment to implementing strict protocols to allow it to operate in a safe and sustainable way. Let me say, Madam Speaker, on Saturday I had a very useful meeting with some representatives of the entertainment sector. We intend to have a series of such meetings in the coming week, up to next week, and that will include cinema operators, party promoters, selectors, all the stakeholders. Because we did it the last time, they put protocols, they suggested protocols, ODPM worked with them, Minister of Local Government worked with them, the Minister of Entertainment, we came up with a plan, but it wasn't always followed strictly. This time we're going to go through another process of meeting with the stakeholders. I'm certain that they have a better understanding of what to do. And so I would say in another two weeks, we should be able to come to Parliament with a plan as to how we are going to reopen the entertainment sector. You know, Madam Speaker, we did it with bars. You will recall how we, how we did it. It was a phased approach. We, monitored, and I think the bars have generally operated fairly well. We want to bring the entertainment industry back, but we are very cautious, we are very careful, and we would need the strong commitment of the stakeholders. Well, I've been, I've been going for more than 30 minutes, so. <laughs> <laughs> Madam, Madam Speaker, while we have relaxed, and I hate to use the word relax, but in some ways it amounts to some relaxation and in others it doesn't. We have recrafted, we have rebalanced the measures. There can be no complacency. Madam Speaker, in how we maintain and how we comply with the rules. Certainly, the requirement to always wear your mask covering your nose and mouth in a public place, as well as the requirement to physically distance from persons, especially those not in your household, and to either wash hands or sanitize frequently must take Priority, Madam Speaker. 
and I hear appeal to the good conscience, to the good intent of all Jamaicans. I can, as I stand here, Madam Speaker, I am, I am seeing what potentially could happen, and uh, I'm very concerned. But I'm also seeing what is happening now in terms of the, the mood of the people and uh, the economic pressures, and we're trying to, to balance. One of the things we have done, Madam Speaker, is to continue to increase the capacity of the health system to respond. We are putting in more beds, putting in more resources, but we just will not have enough nurses and doctors to man those beds. So even though we are trying to increase, it's, that is still a binding constraint. I believe we have made some progress in solving the oxygen challenge. I wouldn't say that we are 100 percent, but we have made some progress in that regard and we are doing more work on that. So we are trying to increase our ability to manage a spike. So it's not that we are just trying to constrain and restrict, but we are also trying to expand our ability to manage a third wave. Madam Speaker, as at Friday, May 28, 2021, approximately 155,683 persons had received the first dose of the vaccine, and 22,206 persons had received their second dose. As of today, the number might be a little bit higher, closer to 25,000. On Sunday, May 30th, 2021, we received an additional 55,200 doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine from the Global COVAX facility. The vaccination program continues to be targeted at any members of the priority groups who have not yet received their first dose, as well as providing the second dose to those who are now due. As a reminder, our priority groups are persons over 60, healthcare workers, JCF, JDF, PICA, Department of Correctional Services, the Jamaica Fire Brigade, and teachers, especially those who instruct students who will be sitting external examinations and returning physically to school. Madam Speaker, I must emphasize how critical it is for persons who have received their first dose of the vaccine to get their second dose. The level of protection from only one dose is significantly lower than the level provided by taking both doses, and it, is, and it declines rapidly after 120, after 120 days. So, Madam Speaker, if you have taken the first dose after 120 days, the immunity starts to decline rapidly. So it is best, Madam Speaker, to get your second dose within that period. And the second dose, we have enough vaccines now to start the inoculation of persons uh, for the second dose, and we are getting more vaccines in. So, Madam Speaker, I am encouraging all the persons who are on the priority list, if you have not yet gotten your first dose, please go and get your first dose. If you have gotten your first dose, make arrangements to get your second dose of vaccine. Madam Speaker, in relation to further vaccine supplies, the government continues to pursue all avenues, bilateral, multilateral, as well as commercial arrangements with suppliers. And Madam Speaker, I'm confident that we will be getting significant supplies in the hundreds of thousands very shortly. Madam Speaker, just on the whole business of the vaccine, we need to achieve herd immunity. Now, if I take the vaccine, take my full dose, I'm protected. Not 100 percent. There's still a possibility that you may contract the disease, but you have a much higher probability of surviving if you 
contract the, the disease. Much higher probability than someone who is not vaccinated. But, Madam Speaker, if I take the vaccine and Minister Clark doesn't take the vaccine, my, my taking the vaccine only protects me. It doesn't necessarily protect Minister Clark unless everybody else inside here or probably I, the, the figure that they have used is between 65 and 75 percent to be considered herd immunity. So you need a high percentage of any group to take the vaccine for there to be the to, right, to, to create the community immunity. Now, Madam Speaker, here is a challenge. There are some people who say, you know what, I am going to wait and be in the 25% that don't take the vaccine. And that is the unfairness of all of this. I must take the risk. Minister Grange must take the risk. All of us who are in that 75% must take the risk. But some people are saying, I am not going to take the risk in order for the community to get the immunity. It is something to consider. If we are going to come out of this pandemic, the government cannot continue with these restrictive measures. It is, I, I load coming to Parliament, spending hours trying to explain so that the population understand and keep the population together. It distracts from all the other things that we should be doing in building the economy. But it is an imperative. We can't take our eyes off it. And the only way we are going to, the only sustainable way is to just get the vaccine. Unless a doctor says, well, you know, you have some conditions that you shouldn't. But outside of that, you have a social duty and responsibility. You can't freeload on the risks that everyone else is taking. And I, I, you know, I, I know I'm going to be attacked and you're going to say all kinds of things, but as leader of the country, I have to say these things. I have to say it. So, I'm hoping, Madam Speaker, that we will see a much higher level of interest in vaccination. The strange thing, Madam Speaker, is that all of us in here have been vaccinated for some disease or the other. Several. Several. Madam Speaker, we have this argument. Nobody was ever saying that we are depriving a child of their right if they don't turn up to school with their vaccination card. That has been the rule in Jamaica for how long? When I was going to primary school, I had to get how much vaccine, and it is still the rule today. So I don't know where this argument has just all of a sudden materialized from. Jamaica has had one of the best history in public health of vaccinating our population. Madam Speaker, one thing you will, well, I don't have to say because you know. My shoulder broad. <laughs> there, there's nothing. No. <laughs> no, I, you know, Madam Speaker, whilst I do pay attention to the things that people say, I am never afraid to challenge some of the notions that are being carried by some of our brightest minds sometimes. Those are the ones that really hurt me. Our brightest minds. That they, they carry some notions. Some of our most influential people who should know better, who should be leading us better. People who have influence on social media and in music, they carry some ideas sometimes you wonder. And when the people are led into a lurch, they disappear. They go quiet. You never hear from them again. They can't help. So, Madam Speaker, this House has to bring the issues up front. We're not hiding from anything. We are confronting the issues. This is not a popularity contest. Yeah. At the end of the day, my conscience must be clear that I have done everything to keep Jamaicans alive, 
and keep Jamaicans in their livelihood. It is not perfect, but you are doing all right. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker. Opposition leader. Thank you. All right. Madam Speaker, I want to thank the Prime Minister for his presentation this evening or this afternoon. This is obviously an ongoing challenge for Jamaica and it is a, an issue which I have always I tried my best to avoid politicizing because the reality is that we are all in this together and the country is facing the hardest of challenges economic public health and so on even psychological because the impact of over a year of nightly curfews and everything else that's happened to so many of our Jamaican people has been truly cumulatively challenging and difficult and it has really affected a lot of people, their hope, their morale, and their general well-being. Prime Minister, like you, I can stand here today and say I have had my second vaccine. I ha in fact, I had it yesterday, so I'm a little, a little sore there, but overall, Overall, I am very pleased that I can now say I'm fully vaccinated. And my 89-year-old mother also had hers. My wife has had hers. So we're coming along. And <clears throat> like you, Prime Minister, I feel very strongly that one of the biggest challenges we face is to persuade our people that it is important, not only as a personal safety measure, but as a safety measure for the family and your community and your country, that you protect yourself and others by getting vaccinated. As you have said, Prime Minister, Jamaica is a country that's very used to vaccinations and inoculation. We've all been through that as children, whether it be tuberculosis, smallpox, Polio is not a, vac is a drop, but still a vaccine, just administered orally. And so many other deep, um, diphtheria and so on. Some of them, uh, rubella, uh, rubella, mumps, measles, yeah, yeah, and what have you. I mean, I remember as a six or seven year old trying to escape being vaccinated and running behind the school building <laughs> to avoid it. But funnily enough, it was two professors' sons who, who, were, who were the most afraid of the thing at that age. But um, we were duly caught and surrendered and got our jabs. And, you know, we are, of course, the better for it. So, you know, we all need, as leaders, we all need to join the dialogue in favor of trying to get our people to come on board with this. And as leaders, <coughs> we set the example and hope that others will follow. And as has been said, it, it's a difficult thing because so many of our people are influenced in an era of pervasive social media by the misinformation that is prevalent that's, and tied in with perhaps a culture that is a little hesitant about the, this particular vaccine as well. And that's a, that combination is a challenging combination for Jamaica, and we have to resist it because ultimately getting our economy back up and running, getting back to a state of normalcy in the society, how we can move around, how we can socialize, how we can worship, 
and so on, is going to be dependent on achieving that percentage, that 65 to 75 percent that the Prime Minister spoke of. So we all as leaders have a duty to try to encourage persons to take a scientific approach, don't embrace or further the interests of those who enjoy spreading misinformation. And let us try to get to the point where we can say Jamaica is essentially COVID free. And I will always support that initiative and play my part, Prime Minister, to promote it because I think it's a national duty. Prime Minister, you spoke passionately on the issue of informality. And you talked about information poverty in your run-up to talking about informality. And the truth is that this information poverty is fed not only by a lack of access that many suffer from in terms of getting broadband and getting access to the internet, which is the main source of information nowadays. But as I have said, grappling with the deluge of misinformation that is fed through those channels on a daily basis. And this, if we're going to talk about information poverty, part of solving that is providing people with a, a skeptical awareness that information is not necessarily true just because it's fed comes up on a screen or comes up on a phone and until we address that issue and allow our people put, give our people the tools, the intellectual tools to approach information that they're receiving with an analytical framework that allows them to decipher and distinguish between nonsense and truth and if they're not sure, to err on the side of caution before propagating information which is often totally untrue and not factual at all. And we will continue to have a, um, this problem of information poverty because misinformation is a critical part of information poverty. And this whole vaccine hesitancy that we're struggling with now is very much part of that information poverty. And Jamaica's really going to have to get over this because so far it hasn't really been that much of an issue because we haven't had the supply of vaccines in the volumes that would be required if everybody, if 65 to 70 percent of the population said, yes, I want this now, we couldn't do it. But as supply situations, conditions improve, and we know that President Biden has committed to making a large stock of vaccines available that the U.S. had procured but don't in fact need, and that may well happen in other countries which overordered. Uh, you know, as the supply situation improves, then vaccine hesitancy is going to be more and more the challenge that Jamaica faces, and we'll have to try and get over it. In terms of informality, Prime Minister, the reality is that, well, we have to ask ourselves, why is there so much informality in Jamaica? You know, we bemoan it, but the question is, why is it so prevalent? It is not just because people have a fixation with informality or a hesitancy to embrace formality. It's not that. The channel... The challenges that go with becoming formalized are burdensome in the country. So many of our processes are user unfriendly, frustrating. I can tell you as a practitioner, I see it. I mean, I don't, you know, I exchanged WhatsApp with my friend, the Minister of Finance and the Public Service, about the stamp office, which is a critical cog in the process of transferring real estate in the country. And getting a sale agreement assessed at the moment for the, the simplest matter 
So, you know, it takes it, 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 it months. It's a process of months. And the purchaser may have their money and ready to purchase. The vendor wants to sell. And that is just the first step in the process, is to get that sale agreement assessed. And it's taking months to get that done. And um, that's just one example. Company's office, I regret to say, <laughs> you know, the, the multiplicity of responses you get uh, to documents in a particular form from the different persons who adjudicate them. It can be very frustrating. I try and avoid it, I must tell you, Prime Minister, as much as possible, because I don't have the patience for it. But, you know, we need to get these things streamlined and simple so that our people who already have a hard enough life just negotiating the everyday realities of Jamaica for persons who are not from privilege. When they interface with the state, they should be embraced, they should be made to feel like wanted customers, and the procedures should be simple and clear and uniform and standardized. And the lack of that is another form of inequality in the country. Yeah. You know, we talk about the approach that the government has taken to the pandemic. And we know that the incident in the grill obviously caused considerable consternation in the society. And I know you came out early, Prime Minister, from you heard about it and <coughs> sought to assure the nation that the government had nothing to do with it. And some will feel that is so, and some will be skeptical. But I just want to make the point that when we amended the Disaster Risk Management Act to introduce stronger enforcement measures for things like wearing a mask, which I'm not wearing right now because I'm speaking, but wearing a mask, gathering, breaching the curfews and so on, it was predicated on a system of ticketing to ensure that if you breach the more minor things in the law, the response to it is one of being given a ticket. That ticketing system is not in place, but the law is being enforced. And the result is that people are arrested, taken to the station, and often bungled up in rooms with poor ventilation while their cases are processed in the station, which is totally counterproductive. I have had experience of this, not personally, but people I know personally who have gone through this. And you know, Prime Minister, we talk about, proudly about, equal enforcement of the law. The Negro situation really contradicts that, but, and that's a high profile one. But everyday experience in, in my constituency, I was speaking to a lady who lives in a yard, and she's building a bathroom facility because there isn't one for her and her family in the yard. And I've been helping her with it, but it's not yet finished. And so when they need to use the bathroom, they have to go down to our neighbor to use the bathroom there. And after the curfew hour comes on upon them, the law enforcement officers that are patrolling the area from time to time run them off the road and won't take, not talk about they need to use the bathroom. And these are the kind of things that create a lot of anxiety and frustration in the population because the laws don't take into account the realities of, of people living at a certain level in the society. Many people can't go in them house from 8 o'clock. Now it'll be 9 o'clock during the week, and we're glad for that, Prime Minister. But it'll be 8 o'clock on Saturday, and it'll be 2 o'clock on Sunday. And the yard, the house hot, is a whole heap of people have to st stay in the house, the house is small, and they're accustomed to living on the road. Where they're accustomed to be out in the open, and it's safer for them to do so, because everybody knows that COVID is the risk of contracting COVID in an enclosed space with poor ventilation is much higher than in the open air. So these are some of the anomalies that I think frustrate many people in Jamaica in the way in which the rules are made and enforced. And um, Prime Minister, the last point I wish to make relates to the time 
on Sundays. I was really hoping and expecting, in fact, that there would have been an extension of time on Sundays beyond 2 o'clock. There are persons who worship on Sundays who feel it's a discriminatory against them, the way the rule is configured. And there are persons who worship on a Saturday and respect their Sabbath on a Saturday who resent the fact that on Sunday they, have, they don't have enough time to do what they, they need to do. So both Saturday and Sunday worshipers feel, feel um, oppressed by the disparity in the rule. I have, a, I, have a, I have a WhatsApp right here that somebody sent me. I don't even know the person. I don't even know the person. They sent me this, and I'll just read it. It says, good afternoon. I am a Sabbath observer. I can hardly move on Sundays to do anything outside the house. So that is, and then I've had people who are Sunday worshippers who complain about the fact that they have to come off the road at 2, whereas persons who worship on a Saturday have until, well, it was 6, and it's now going to be 8. So, you know, I think the, the, the lack of any kind of symmetry there, which I, I, I really must say, the logic of it doesn't, is not clear to me. But the, 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 that rule, that disparity, is something that is not welcomed by a very reasonable population. Our population has been more than reasonable in, in, in living through this thing. We have been living under curfew for how long? 15 months? Nightly curfew. I mean, for young people, it is, it is a, it's unbelievable what for them, what they have to go through. I mean, persons with teenage or young adult children know how the cramping of their social life for this prolonged period is something that has affected them far more than it affects somebody of, of our age. Anyway, Prime Minister, those are my comments. I know my colleagues ha may have something to say as well, and I will bring up close to my presentation. I just want to reiterate, Prime Minister, we are not seeking to politicize the response of the government to a very difficult situation. I acknowledge that it's a very difficult situation. It's a question of proportionality and balance. And whatever you do, somebody's going to complain you haven't got it quite right. So I sympathize with that, and I understand that. And, but where they balance appears to me to be out of whack, my job is to say so. And I will do so in as constructive a way as I can. And Prime Minister, when it comes to the things that are really going to make a difference, which is a vaccination of our people, I am on board and you have my full support. Madam, Madam Speaker, Monday night in forever. <laughs> I have a couple of questions for the Prime Minister. In the data that you presented, you didn't spend any time or much time looking at the number of deaths. And of the 949 deaths that have been recorded, 158 have occurred in the last four weeks. Wow. So we have had actually a spike in the number of deaths. And I don't know if you have consulted with the technical team to determine what the explanation is for the increase in the number of deaths. That would represent 17% of the total since we started measuring from March last year, which would be obviously disproportionate if you look at that over a 16-month period. And I asked within the context of the WHO, I think last week, made an observation that a number of countries have understated the number of COVID deaths. In fact, for Peru, they have increased, I think, by two and a half times the number of actual deaths from COVID versus what was reported before. Yeah. So while we welcome the fall in the positivity rate in the number of, of persons um, testing positive, positive the, the death number is a number which is cause for cancer and hospitalization. Yeah. Secondly, I know you, you said we're going to be getting some new vaccines. I don't know if you have any more specificity in terms of timing. Um, I know you're in touch with the, your U.S. counterpart um, because the, well, the question would be, are the current batch of vaccines enough 
to inoculate everybody who has gotten a first dose? No. Okay. And then the question would be, what would be the shortfall that would be needed to ensure that, that everybody? Well, you could, you could ask. Um, my colleague from Central St. Mary, who isn't here, has asked me to ask about the gene sequencing machine, which he has raised, a number, raised on a number of occasions and wants to know what the status of that is, and also whether the technical team has determined whether we have any new variants that have been discovered in the country apart from the UK variant. And then two other questions, Prime Minister. One, and the Minister of Education is behind you, whether there is any consideration given the fall in numbers for a return, even for the remainder of the term, to some face-to-face -face yeah. for, for, for um, schools. Mm -hmm. I know we only have maybe a month and a half for the rest of the term, but we have lost so much during this period where students have not been able to access education. And then finally, on the order for persons 60 and over to stay at home, and I had to ask the Attorney General to intervene in a matter which resulted positively in a resolution. But many employers have interpreted it to mean that healthy 60 years and over persons should not work. And they have actually sent home persons, deprived persons of an income. Wow. Uh, yes, I've had two cases. One, as I said, I consulted with the AG. So I believe there is need for some clarification that if somebody is healthy, they have done their vaccine, they're in good shape, the 60 and over order would not apply to them. Right? But employers have been using it, whether unintentionally or not, to force persons not to work. And many people have lost incomes as a result. Just this morning, one of my constituents called to say that she had returned just last, last evening from a trip to um, her family, her children in Miami. But that on returning, we went to the airport. The problems with the Jam COVID oh, yes. app was, really? was significant. She, she outlined to me um, what happened to her from 7.30 when she arrived at the airport until 4 o'clock when she had, she had to buy another ticket um, to get on the flight. And she had to call Jamaica. And when she described to me what happened, it seems to me that the upshot of that was that the the information, I don't know what more, I know it has been in place for a while, it has been brought widespread, people know about it, but perhaps we need to look to see what more can be done. And that is, it is particularly difficult for the elderly population as they try to move around. I think we need to give it some more consideration to see what more can be done to assist that population. Hmm? And Prime Minister, just three quick questions, more for clarification. You mentioned about the concession, and I was particularly struck that they said concession with the reduction to eight days for those who are totally vaccinated. My question in that regard is, is the eight-day reduction, no, to eight, I mean, eight reduction to eight days, is it informed by scientific data, or is it other consideration that arrives at the eight day for the fully vaccinated persons. And I say that against the background of, you know, you made a passing comment to my colleague about the CDC um, protocols for fully vaccinated persons, where they are allowing no mask, for example, among, among um, fully vaccinated persons. My question flows from the first one. Is the Minister of Health giving consideration to CDC um, protocols in our jurisdiction or not. And I ask the Prime Minister against the background, as you will appreciate, our, pers our people in Jamaica are very attuned to the United States and Canada and, and, and have expectations. So I would like you to just, to just speak to, um, to that. And lastly, the, um, you mentioned about the 30 persons for gathering for ceremonies 
and so forth in the government, in the public sector, and in overs and other ceremonies like those. Why is it only, let me ask, is the private sector who has similar ceremonies for the same person so permitted? Okay, okay. sorry, I heard that you did say it, sorry. Thank you, thank you members. I, I must say that I particularly enjoyed uh, this uh, debate. Um, I mean, I'm certain all debates are conducted in the true spirit of seeking the truth and, and um, seeking the best interests of our constituents. But I think this particular debate um, uh, has been conducted, Madam Speaker, as if in, in the highest spirit of parliamentary debate. That, that I, I feel good about that. Madam Speaker, the, the comments of the leader of the opposition are um, welcomed, um, and, and I think, Madam Speaker, are, are very mature comments as to... But, Madam Speaker, as it relates to the Saturday and Sunday, uh, Madam Speaker, we considered it very carefully. And uh, the issue for the Saturday is that it has been traditionally a commercial day, traditionally a market day. Um, and uh, Madam Speaker, the business community, but more than the business community, the rural communities, the people who depend on their Saturday markets for their hustle and their income, they have been complaining. And it is filtering up through their members of parliament, in particular the farmers who are seeking to get their produce to the big Saturday markets to sell. And so the consideration was that they needed more time. Uh, and that is why, Madam Speaker, that we have increased the Saturday hours. The Sunday hours, um, yes, we, we actually contemplated giving more time for worship. But here is the thing that I bring members into the decision-making process. We're giving, we're having exams. So we're having more movement of a younger population who may not in their movement necessarily follow all the protocols. And they're, they're having face-to-face, -face, some of them, and they have to go to lessons. So just that one population, that one group of the population moving could cause an increase. So that it is not that they're just going to be moving on transportation and going to market, which are, as you have pointed out, open-year events. They are going into classrooms. They are going to be mixing with different households, and they are going to be mixing with different age group, some of whom are vulnerable, and then they're going to return home. The same thing for churches. So the more we allow more movement of different groups that are going to interact with, with different age groups, you're going to increase the chances of the spread. So I can't be allowing all that we have allowed and then you know, allow even more movement for other groups. I have to at least keep one day where we limit the movement almost as a kind of precautionary compensatory measure so that we, we, we don't have all, all days having the maximum potential for infection and transmission. And that, and that is why we have kind of kept Sunday as a half no movement day, if you want to look at it like that, just as a precaution. As I've said, we're going to review it. We're seeing how well those protocols are going to be maintained as soon as the exams are finished and that movement of young people it would be limited, then we could consider increasing um, for, for churches. But that's the kind of balancing that we have to do in terms of just looking at groups and movements in the society. Uh, in terms of the, the curfew hours, you have raised uh, a particular situation which we could not, I mean, I, I guess we could legislate in the uh, in the DRMA, but uh, uh, I mean, to give a reason that I need to go and use the bathroom. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm not laughing at it. It's, it's you know, it, it could be a potential for for um, for, for misuse. So we, what we would 
do in these instances, now that you have mentioned it, is that we will speak with the police commissioner and uh, ask them to sensitize. Because, you know, the, the, the truth is that the, the, the police have conducted themselves with a high level of restraint and sensitivity, but they have to be guided. Most, Most yes. They, they, they have to be guided. And so what you have raised, I will seriously bring this to the attention of the commissioner uh, uh, for them to exercise restraint. But just, just to be clear, though, the stay-at-home restrictions under the curfews are not solely to the house. It is to the yard, the curtilage of, of, of the, 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 the property. So you can move about in your yard freely. You can, you can, you can use your side gate to the neighbor. And, and if you're in your high rise, the same situation. As long as you're on your stairs in the, in the, in, in the common areas, that's fine. That is related to the property. The, the, the issue is when you go onto a public thoroughfare that is when the, the, the curfews would apply. Um, as it relates to, 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 to vaccines, I'm just trying to see if I have... So as it relates to, 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 to vaccines, we would have enough vaccines to, to cover for the first dose for everyone who is in the private group for a first dose. The challenge is that not everyone has taken it in the first. So even though the leader of the opposition has said, well, we don't have enough vaccines, technically we have enough vaccines for all those who should get it, but they have not, the priority groups, and they have not, and that is a, the hesitancy of which I'm, I'm really pointing out. The, the uniform officers, the, the, the JCF numbers are of some concern. The JDF numbers are concerning as well, but they have been improving uh, in, in, the, in the public health sector. It is concerning. I would have hoped that we would have seen a higher level of take-up. We encourage the, the members in the priority groups, and I'm encouraging our teachers to take up the vaccines. Um, so what we're doing now is to prioritize the first groups and for persons who got their first dose and want to get their second dose. So we have enough to, you know, at the current rate to satisfy the demand. We will be getting some more vaccines. I don't want to give too, too much details because uh, in, in these matters, you will be told you're getting it in two weeks' time, and then something happens and it's another week. And, and, but we do have the arrangements in place, um, both with COVAX and with the, the African platform, uh, and commercial arrangements with manufacturers. And there is always the potential that the United States may make available. So we are, we are optimistic in the near future of uh, vaccine availability. Um, the gene sequencing machine, the, the, the last, and I'm just going from memory, so I might not have the, the latest information on it, um, is, is that they, have, they are entering into the procurement of it. So it's, it's on its way, in a sense. Um, in terms of, uh, and you know that gene sequencing machine, a member from Central St. Mary ought to be credited. He slipped me a little note to say, you need this. That's why he's Yes, yes, yes. Um, and it will be very useful because with new strains, the new variants, the gene sequencing machine will give us the ability to rapidly identify. You recall the last time we had to send overseas to determine, and it, it took a long time. In, in terms of the return to face-to-face, -to -face, it is unlikely. I mean, let me put it that, that way. It is unlikely that you would see any mass return of face-to-face -face schooling right now, except for those who are going to be sitting exams. Uh, the 60 and over, you had raised the issue as to whether or not employees could use this as a means of sending home or dismissing workers. And that is not the intention of the law. Uh, and uh, um, in fact, it would be illegal for them to do that. The, the DRMA does not say you can't work. You can work from home. You can work remotely. 
and the DRMA does allow a person 60 and over who is under the stay at home to leave their home once per day to look about um, critical business. So if they, if, if they are you know, a manager or supervisor or something, or they own a business, they, they can go in, just do what they have to do quickly and go back home. Or they can work from home, but it doesn't mean that they can't work. Um, just to repeat, no, if you are fully vaccinated, you are no longer under the stay-at-home measure. And the fully vaccinated, you have had your full dose two weeks after you're considered fully vaccinated, 60 and over. If you haven't had your full vaccination, you are still under the requirement to stay at home, and it is in your interest to do so. Uh, in terms of the jam COVID and travelers, most of the complaints that I've gotten about jam COVID is the speed of the return of the authorization. And, the, and most of those complaints, when you go and dig behind it, it is that they are asking for authorization having applied the day before. And are some even, even when they're you know, at the airport. Uh, and I've got many calls you know, with people saying, I need to travel, I need to travel, but I forgot, or I didn't know. You're right, um, the older population may not be aware, and especially no more people are traveling, they may not be aware. And we will reiterate this, that they, they have to um, go on the Jam COVID website and apply. Give us some time, maybe two or three days. Usually there is a kind of routine turnaround. Oh, some of them don't have tablets and... Then, Madam Speaker, in terms of the quarantine, eight days, why, why eight days? What's the, the science, if, if it is scientific? Let me, let me just say that if you are not vaccinated, if you are not vaccinated, the 14 days quarantine still applies. So that, that is clear. So that's the application of the science. It is still being assessed as to what is the risk of a vaccinated person carrying the disease, not the disease, sorry, carrying the virus and infecting others. And the science is saying that there is that risk, there is that possibility. There is also the risk of a vaccinated person becoming ill from the virus. If, so let's say they, they contracted a different strain of the virus, for example. So we have, so the, 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 the longer period, which is what we're trying to, to balance, would help us to see whether or not an infection is starting to manifest, right? Yeah, and we have, we have looked. So other countries are using seven, some are using five. We have decided to, to use a longer period just for our own safety and precaution. Right, so, so safety and precaution. Let's not, let's not run any risk more than we need to. Right? We, have, we, have, we have reduced it significantly, but we're, we're not going down to, yeah. So that, that is what has informed us. So the, 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 the science is that even vaccinated persons still have a risk, though minimal. The challenge for us is that only 5% of our population is vaccinated. So, so we have to be very careful. So the question that you have asked about do we pay attention to the CDC protocols? We pay attention to all credible um, public health agencies and their, their prescriptions and, and pronouncements. But Jamaica has to make its own decisions based upon our own um, exigencies here. So we pay attention to it, but we use our own exigencies. Go ahead. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I, I really had one question based a follow-up to the Prime Minister. Because one of the, and I appreciate the balancing act that we all have to go through, especially as MPs and, and really formulating that. But one of the concerns, even in the inequality of the presence of persons, um, has to do with public spaces and even corporate spaces and, and some of the government spaces like the tax office and the transportation centers, etc. So what you also have are persons who are in the entertainment industry saying, well, if you have 100 persons um, waiting at the tax office, or if you have 150 persons traveling an, on an airline, how do you justify that you can't have other things? Now, you've dealt with that, and I understand the recrafting. 
But the question I have specifically with the vaccines, if it is that we need to get to that place, what I have seen in other jurisdictions in the United States, having traveled there, is that apart from acclimating their society to be vaccinated, they have also coordinated the society in terms of rapid testing at various points, um, mass distribution, etc. So what are we going to do to perhaps even subsidize in public spaces, maybe rapid testing at, at, at various levels, mass distribution, and how can we incentivize the population to take the vaccine? In other words, the vaccination blitz have worked, but it, it still doesn't strike me that, that it's enough. So what can we do? Because I was saying to my colleague from, from St. Mary that I remember lining up at school and sometimes all of the, the, the one said Negla inject everybody back in the day. And people were, it's, it's a difference. I'm asking your prime minister for us to get there. What are we going to do? The questions that were on, on my list before. Yeah. So um, the issue of gatherings, uh, AGMs and so forth, um, we have now increased the AGM limit to, was it 30? To 30. Um, so they, we're, we're allowing private sectors, uh, um, groups to be able to have critical meetings like AGMs. But Madam Speaker, um, the reason for the government in particular is that there are many functions and events and critical meetings that need to happen to keep the machinery of state turning that uh, without question this has been restrictive and so um, we have decided to ensure that the, the, the wheel of the, the public wheel is, is turning uh, so we have increased that number from 15 to, to 30. Now, as it relates to, to vaccination and what we're going to do, the Attorney General reminds me that our laws allow for the compulsory vaccination of children for certain diseases. But the, the notion of requiring vaccination, therefore, is not new in our jurisprudence. Um, I, I don't want to end up on that conversation because that's not where we're, where we're going. Where we're, where we're going is to get voluntary compliance, to get people to reach that point where they voluntarily go and seek the vaccine. So we, we're looking to ensure positive health-seeking behavior. So you have asked about incentives. The Minister of Finance announced in his budget presentation that we're going to do a care program that is a conditional cash transfer, that if you show your, you, you have taken your, your vaccine, you will get um, some support under the care program. And the, the Minister of Finance will say more about that. I mean, I've heard the criticisms about it, but conditional cash transfers are standard economic policy tools to get behavior change. And this is a behavior change that we need. As I said earlier, the fundamental issue is one that you need to get the population to, to 65 to 75%, right? And how do we get people to that level? You're going to have to incentivize in some ways, and we are prepared to do so. This particular program, though, is focused on the most vulnerable. What was the age limit again, Minister? That was... Okay, all right. So, so but it is, it is focused on the most vulnerable. So um, we, we'll, set, we'll disclose what the age limit is and, and so forth. But, uh, and I think we can justify it if we focus on the most vulnerable. Um, indirectly, we are giving incentives. So for example, reducing the quarantine period for fully vaccinated persons indirectly creates a kind of incentive. In, indirectly does. Uh, relieving the 60 and over who are fully vaccinated from the stay at home indirectly creates an incentive. We have been giving out masks. I must say that we have given out enough. Uh, just on a political note, we have given out close to 20 million masks. <laughs> Not the government, but the, oh, the, the, the political party has, and, and we have given out quite a bit. Uh, and um, 
No, no, not all green. Not all green. Not all green. Not all green masks. Not all green masks. Uh, and, and I will have words with the Minister of Health to restart that program because uh, they, they have been giving out, but it's not a consistent giving out. And ADPEM has been giving masks. Uh, members, I want to thank you for, for the question. Just remind me. Oh, sorry, the death rate. Right. So um, I don't have, I didn't come prepared to, to discuss that. I'm just giving you what I have, what I was told in a discussion that was not specific about the death rate, which is that uh, they have been resolving cases that took persons who died um, in periods before that they did not resolve as to whether or not they are COVID related and they are now making those resolutions. So you're seeing some of those numbers being reflected. But it, it could be that there is outside of that an increase. And I, I couldn't say that here because I don't know, but I will get the data and, trans, and transmit that to you. Oops, I turned off, thank you. Um, you said that we shouldn't expect a whole scale face-to-face -face for, you said we shouldn't expect a whole scale face-to-face -face for education. But I wanted to ask if there is any thought being given for early childhood and infant departments in terms of any changes where that is concerned. Just given what is happening, given the importance of um, the socialization and um, our healthcare workers who are parents and persons who are supporting our frontline staff. So that's one question. And then just another um, question, suggestion. If we are targeting in any specific way our teachers in terms of the public education, the discussion around what their concerns are, so that we could see an increase in um, the take up for the vaccine. no um, contemplation just yet for early childhood and basic schools, early childhood institutions, including basic schools. Um, the, the Ministry of Education uh, is examining how that can be done and how it could be done. Um, and we have already said that we'll have to look at summer and, and so forth as possibilities. But as of now, there is no official position for that, all right, just to make that clear. And yes, we are engaging with the teachers and the teachers union, the JTA directly. Uh, we have gotten some positive responses, but you know, there is a, a high level of skepticism there, no, no question. So the, the public education and engagement has to continue. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Most Honorable Prime Minister. House Leader. Madam Speaker, thank you, Prime Minister. Thank you, sir. Madam Speaker, as there is no further business contemplated for today, I now ask that the House be adjourned till Tuesday, June 8th at 2 p.m. The sectoral debate will continue with presentations by the Minister of Culture, Gender, Entertainment and Sport and Member of Parliament for Central St. Catherine, one Olivia Grange. <laughs> as well as um, presentation by the Member of Parliament for St. Catherine East and Opposition Spokesperson Agenda. So Madam Speaker, I ask for the adjournment of the House to June 8th at 2 p.m. sharp. Thank you. The question is that the House be adjourned until next Tuesday, June 8th at 2 p.m. Those in favor? Those opposed, the ayes have it. This honorable house now stands adjourned. <laughs>